A working day at NBC is 75 shows long, at least. When NBC isn't entertaining you with Crosby, Benny, Hope, Gildersleeve, Information Please, and many others, it brings you good informative talk. Harkness, Caltenborn, the Chicago Round Table, Consumer Time, and guest speakers to keep you up to the minute on the news, the political situation, and the use of your ration points. And that isn't all. Last year, 46 days and 22 hours of airtime recruited military personnel, sold war bonds, sought blood donors and war workers. It takes many days of hard work to win a war. As their contribution to victory, NBC and its independent affiliated stations spend their days working and planning and building programs to entertain and inform radio listeners everywhere. This is the National Broadcasting Company. There's a common phrase that's being kicked around in your house and mine more and more every day, and that is high cost of living. Sound familiar? I'll bet it does. I'm sure you've heard Mother and Dad mention it more often than once, and you will undoubtedly hear it many more times as the days go by. Now, just in case you're hazy on exactly what it means, let me give you a rough idea. It means that the cost of your clothes and food has gone up to a point where the family budget has become somewhat strained. Well, that's one of those things. And you can't be expected to increase the family income. But there are some things you can do to help. For instance, take better care of your clothes. When you come home from school, change into old clothes before you go out to play. Take care of your health, because doctors and medicines are expensive. Eat well, but don't waste. Take your full share, but eat all you take. Try not to ask mother and dad to buy you things you don't actually need. Make the best and the most of what you've got. Try to be more than usually careful of your school equipment, such as paper, pencils, and so forth. Make them last and go as far as you possibly can. Remember that all members of a family must pull together at a time like this. So do your share. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Where was the car parked? 61st and what? Were the doors locked? Yeah. What kind of a car is it? What you You're in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. You come into the station house. We'll have to take a report from you. That's right. It's between Lexington and 3rd. As soon as you can. Yeah. All right. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. At 6, after I had turned out the platoon, interviewed an applicant for a tow truck license, and cleaned up considerable paperwork, I instructed Sergeant Waters on T.S. to have sector car number 1 come by the station house and take me on patrol of the precinct. Patrol of the precinct by the commanding officer, in addition to responding to emergency radio calls as they occur, generally involves a personal check of conditions concerning which complaints from the public have been received. In connection with the investigation of such a complaint, I instructed Patrolman Coley, the operator of sector car number one, to drive to 88th Street and Madison Avenue. At 7.20 p.m., we were in the car proceeding uptown on Park Avenue in the 70s. The weather was cold and extremely windy. So, when the landlord came to collect the rent, I happened to be home. Uh-huh. I invited him to come in the living room and sit down. He said, you're almost two weeks late with the rent, Mr. Coley. I said, I know it. I said, I wrote you a letter and told you we wouldn't pay the rent until you send somebody to fix the refrigerator. He said, I was stalling him, trying to pull my badge that I was a cop on him. He was going to write the commissioner and make a complaint against me. How do you like that, Captain? Well, what did you say? Well, I told him to write anybody he wanted to write. Still wasn't going to get the rent until the refrigerator was fixed. I don't know what these guys think they can get away with. Well, some of them try, Coney. Yes, sir. After the light changes, take a left into 77. Go up Madison the rest of the way. Yes, sir. Yeah, 
Mr. Catton. Yeah. What do you think of those two guys in the cattle left there? Yeah. They so good to me. They're sure making an effort to act calm, aren't they? Yes, sir. When the light changes take off behind them, we get a look at the registration plates. I have the two guys that didn't own a new Cadillac, that's them. All right, there's the light. Let them go ahead. Okay. It's an Illinois car. I don't remember any Illinois Cadillac in your arms. Let's talk to him, Coley. Yes, sir. Watch out, they don't try to pull away from you. They could, too. All right, give him the horn. Pull over there! Pull over! Go for it. No, they're not. It's okay. Block them off when they stop. Yes, sir. I'll take the driver. Yes, sir. You take the other side. Watch him now. Yes, sir. What's the trouble, officer? That's what we want to find out. Let's see the registration and your operator's license. Oh, I forgot to take them. They're on the dresser. We made every light, didn't we? Yeah, every light. You! Keep your hands up there where I can see them. Is this your car? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, no. Well, whose is it? A friend of ours. Right, Ruby? Yeah, right. A friend lent us. He lent you the car, but not the keys, huh? Well, you see, we're Keep not... your hands on the steering wheel. Right, I'll keep them there. I'll keep them. And they got a jumper on the ignition, Captain. Are those your suitcases in the back? Not of his. Who said they were mine? I didn't. Come on. Out this way. Out of the car? Come on. Both of you. Now, keep your hands where we can see them. You. Lean up against the car there. Here? Yeah. Right there, yeah. Come on around, Coley. Yes, sir. All right, you. Right next to him. I, for one, would like to know what this is all about. So would I. Lean up there. I'm leaning, I'm leaning. Okay, Captain, I got him covered. All right. You first. Hold still. I got nothing. What are you worried about? I'm carrying nothing. Oh. What do you call this? A pen knife. That's what it is. Ain't a guy inside to have a pen knife? Not with an eight-inch blade. Well, I use it to peel apples. I like apples. All right. Just keep quiet. Now, you. Hold still. Look, I was doing nothing. He asked me if I'd like to take a ride. I asked you. Quiet. I got two witnesses to prove he asked me. His cousin Scar, he said. What cousin? All right. I got no cousin. What's your name? Me? You. Leon Gamer. Where do you live? 361 Charles Street. In Manhattan? Yeah, in Manhattan. How old are you? 22. Where'd you steal the car? It belongs to his cousin. I thought you said it belonged to your friend. His cousin is my friend. I got no cousin. What's your name? Protea, Reuben Protea. Where do you live? 289 East 109th Street. Not my cousin. I got no cousin. Then who is the man? What man? Okay. What man? That's enough. All right, enough. Keep your eye on them, Coley. Yes, sir. I'll ring in for some help. Well, just stay like that. Don't move. Six eighty one to Central. Okay. At seventy ninth Street and Park Avenue, northeast corner. We require assistance in handling two prisoners in a stolen car. Okay. Okay, Coley, they're sending another car over. Yes, sir. I did nothing. Nothing. Don't say my cousin, I got no cousin. Go for a ride. Get some air. That's all I was invited to do. Well, you've got another invitation now, mister. To a party. You're giving it. Within two minutes, sector car number four, patrolman Gerald Ryan, operator, and patrolman Daniel Ziegler, recorder, arrived at the scene. A more thorough search of the prisoner's persons was conducted. No additional weapons were found. We also made a search of the Cadillac sedan. The ignition had been jumped to enable the thieves to start the car without a key. Although the favorite tool of car thieves, a beer can opener, was found on the floor of the car, there were no marks on any doors or windows indicating that the car had been broken into. In the back seat were two large suitcases and two smaller ones. The glove compartment was locked, so was the luggage compartment. Sergeant Fred Burns arrived on the scene with his car and operator. Sector car number four was instructed to resume patrol. Both prisoners were loaded into the space behind the front seat of sector car number one, and were driven to the station house in the custody of Patrolman Coley and myself. Sergeant Burns followed, driving the Cadillac, which he parked in the passageway next to the station. The two prisoners carrying the luggage that was in the car were taken directly upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad by Patrolman Coley and myself. All right, go on, move along. We're moving, we're moving. This stuff is heavy. That way. 
Go ahead. Why I gotta listen to you, I don't know. Listen to me what? Okay. Every time I listen to you, I wind up in a jam. Every time. Inside, drive up Park Avenue, he says. There's lots of Cadillacs on Park Avenue. Well, ain't that Park Avenue's lousy with Cadillacs? Over there to the desk. So why did this one have to stick out like a covered wagon? Where do I put the bags? Hold on to them for a minute. You catching, Novak? Yeah. Who you got there? The Brinks Bandits? Hello, Captain. Novak? Now, we jumped him on 79th and Park driving a Cadillac. Not theirs. Well, I wouldn't expect it to be. Well, it's a free country, ain't it? I could own a Cadillac. Yeah, you could, but if I were you, I'd buy a pair of shoes first. So where'd you steal the car? Well, look at me. Look at him. I was just along for the ride. You were driving, so that makes who along for the ride? Me, that's who. Where do you want the suitcases, Captain? Hold on to them. Look, what is this? Grand Central Station? Hold on to them. All right, all right. You don't have to take offense just because I made a remark. Where's Lieutenant King, Novak? In his office? Yes, sir. Hey, you, what's your name? Me? I'll be in uh, there with you. him. Yes, sir. Protea, Ruben Protea. All right, where do you live, Protea? Captain Kennelly. Hello, Matt. Captain, leave the door open, would you? Yeah, sure. Shut off the heat in here. It gets ice cold. Leave it on. Burns up. That radiator knows no middle ground. Now, what have we got out there? I was on patrol with Coley. We jumped a couple of thieves in the Cadillac. Oh, good work, Captain. Car's got Illinois plates. There were some suitcases in the back seat. Uh huh. The car's not in the alarms or in the automobile list. They say where they got it, Captain. No, they didn't say anything yet, Matt. Oh, they will. Let's have a look at them. Sure. You know they look like a couple of users to me, Matt. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. You don't need a job to have an occupation, do you? Well, that's true. That's that's very true. All right, what's your occupation? Well, you know the guys that put down linoleum and tiles on the floors? Yeah. Is that what you do? No. I'm a helper. The linoleum layer, he says, uh, hey, Leon, get this, get that. So I get it for him. That's my occupation. Yeah. Only I ain't working. What do you call stealing Cadillacs? Who's this? A new ingredient has been added. Lieutenant King. Hey, Ruby, a lieutenant and a captain both. That's better than last time, huh? Yeah, we're getting up in the world. When was last time? When? I don't know. Three, four weeks ago. Before Christmas. Before Christmas, huh, Ruby? After Thanksgiving. Oh, I'll kill him. Where was it? Down in my neighborhood in the village. All we had then was detectives. Now a lieutenant and a captain. Boy, this is living. Yeah, living. I should shine you. Where was it? Sixth Precinct? Yeah, I think so. Is that right, Ruby? I, I don't know. The police stations all look alike. What'd you get picked up for? Stealing out of cars. They caught us with a key that we took out of a car down there. What happened to the case? Oh, we're out on bail. Two thousand dollars bail. A thousand for him, a thousand for me. So you're out thieving again. Oh, well, listen, a bondsman costs us fifty dollars a piece. We gotta pay for him some way, don't we? We gotta live, don't we? We gotta live high. High on a hog. That's us, right, Ruby? Right, high on a hog. You stick around, boys. We'll show you how to come down a notch. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Did you ever pick up a newspaper or magazine, read an interesting article, and then put it down and say to yourself, I wish I knew more about that? Well, you're in a position to know more about a number of things. As a member of the United States Armed Forces, you have the opportunity to continue your education through the United States Armed Forces Institute. USAFI courses are almost limitless. There might even be one on the subject of that article you read. A simple inquiry on your part can open up vast new horizons to you. You may study alone or in a group. Both types of courses are available through USAFI. Why not take advantage of this opportunity? Develop power through knowledge with a USAFI course. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Frank Kennelly. The detectives of the 21st Squad, under the supervision of Lieutenant King, began to make a case of grand larceny automobile against the two suspects, Leon Gamer and Ruben Protea. As required by law, the suspects were fingerprinted by Detective Novak. The locked suitcases found on the rear seat of the automobile were moved into Lieutenant King's office. The 6th Detective Squad in Greenwich Village was telephoned for information concerning their arrest in that precinct and the charge of grand larceny already pending against them. Although it was obvious the car had been stolen, no report of the theft was in the alarms, nor had one been received by the Communications Bureau. As frequently happens, it appeared that stolen property had been recovered before the owner was even aware it was missing. While the arresting officer, Patrolman Coley, kept one suspect under guard in the squad office, the other, Leon Gamer, was questioned by Lieutenant King in his office in the presence of myself and Detective Novak. Pretty suitcase, isn't it, Leon? Uh, personally, I don't like the color, but it's pretty, yeah. And heavy. You're telling me I had to lug it up the stairs. The 
It's heavy. There must be a lot of good stuff in there. Maybe telephone books. Suits, ties, shirts, maybe even jewelry or money. Yeah, maybe. Why don't you try to open it for any of the others? Oh, now I ask you, would that be honest? Look, Leon, save your comedy routine for the tombs. We're trying to get someplace here. We want to find out who that stuff belongs to. If I knew, I'd tell you. You think i got to be personally acquainted with somebody before I touch their car? My point is, you couldn't have been far from where you lifted the car before you were jumped by the officers. No, not too far, I don't guess. Because if it was more than a mile away, you'd have had the catches on that bag pried open to see what was inside. Look, I don't know exactly where it was. I don't carry a map around in my head. We pulled up together for that light on 77th and Park. How long before that was it? Not long. Was it below 72nd Street? 72nd Street? Yeah, it could be. Then you drove at least six blocks on Park Avenue. Oh, more. Much more. Was it farther downtown than 72nd Street? You got the car? Look, Lieutenant, you want me to be honest with you? I want you to make the effort. You want the whole story, what happened? Yes. I got nothing to hide. I'm hooked. If you'll have the patience, I'll give you the best of my recollections. All right, give it to us. I'll get it, Lieutenant. Okay. Okay, Leon, the best of your recollection. 21st squad, Detective Novak. Let's have it. I can't concentrate with somebody on the phone. Captain Canelli, Sergeant Waters on TS for you. Okay, so can you wait a second? All right. We'll Thanks, second, Novak. Leon. Yes, sir. Captain Canelli. Sergeant Waters on TS, Captain. Yes, Sergeant. Yes, desk officer at the 17th rang up here. Yeah? A motorcycle patrolman skidded on a patch of ice coming off the East River Drive to 53rd Street. Well, has he hurt bad? They took him to Bellevue. Possible fractured leg. All right. Bring the desk officer back and tell him I'm on my way. And have a car come by the house for me. Yes, sir. Cop hurt in the 17th, Matt. I've got the vision tonight. I'll have to go investigate it. Is he bad? A broken leg, they think. Well, I once broke a leg jumping over a fence when I was a kid. We don't want your life history, Leon. Just what happened tonight. Look, if he's going to go, let him go. I can't concentrate with the interruptions. The captain has to wait for a car to come in and get him. You don't worry about what we do. You worry about yourself. We'll give you plenty on your mind. Now, what happened? Well, I met Ruby. Where? I'll tell you if you give me the chance. Met him in a bar and grill on 110th Street. We were sitting there having a couple of beers, and he said, how much dough you got? I said, why? Well, he said his brother wanted some of the money back, the 50 bucks he borrowed from his brother to pay the bondsman. I said, don't look at me. I'm living from hand to mouth, too. I didn't pay back the money I borrowed to pay the bondsman. And we got to talking about how the trial is set next month, that even if we cop a plea, we're sure to get no less than two years apiece out of it. We got a lawyer to pay, and we still owe for the bail. And here we are with not five dollars between us. Not even enough for a good jolt, huh? Oh, look, don't get me wrong. I don't mess around with that stuff. Just chippy once in a while. I got no big habit. So you got five dollars between you. Yeah. Well, I don't know who mentioned it first, me or Ruby, but one of us said, let's go downtown and see if we can make some money. So we finished the beer and got on a Madison Avenue bus. We went downtown. Why'd you get off? I don't have to ask Ruby that. I got no idea. He said, come on. I got off. We walked around a little bit. I don't know. We saw this caddy parked there. I looked in and there were these suitcases in the back. I looked at Ruby and we walked by. He said, a cinch. The button isn't down in the back door. So we walked to the corner, turned around and come back, just like we owned a car. We walked up, opened the door and got in. I was behind the driver's seat. One, two, three. Ruby was on the floor and had the ignition jump. Like a flash. You know, he's quick, that kid. He's got a real talent. He said, go. I went. And that's that. Well, I'll see you, man. Okay, Captain. So long, Captain. All back. Right. Don't go away mad. I'll, uh, check with you, huh, Matt? Yes, sir. Well, looks like you'll have to go to court in the morning, Coley. Yes, sir. Hey, what's that for us? Can't you keep quiet for two seconds? Well, I try. Don't say I don't try. Had a dentist appointment, but uh, that won't be hard to cancel. All right. I'll leave instructions with the desk officer that you're to go on reserve after you get those two booked in. Yes, sir. Thanks, Captain. It was a good caller. Hey, what gives him there? What's he telling him? You'll get your turn, Ruby. Well, see you later, Coley. Yes, sir. Good boss? Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a cop. Well, at least you got to know a few. There was this cop over there on my block, the regular guy. I wanted to be like him. And I got to hate him. Yeah? Yeah, he took me in. Grabbed me by the collar, took me in. And for what? For nothing, for stealing. So I decided not to be a cop. Well, you had a pretty good reason. What's he telling him in there? How much could there be to say? You think I could talk? That Leon, boy, chew your arm off. I got nothing against cops. I even like you. 
Thanks. Oh, but that's nothing. Don't be too glad I like everybody. Even Leon. If anybody could like Leon. He ain't very particular about his friends. What's he telling them, do you think? All about the deal, I guess. Well, he could leave something for me to say. I'll go in there and stand like a dope. They'll know everything i got to tell them. Oh, here they come. All right, go over there and sit down, Leon. Over where? Over here with him? That's right. Come on, Ruby. What'd you tell him, Leon? Get going, Ruby. My life history, A to Z. Well, what'd you tell him about me? Come on. Yeah, all right. Just don't make me out a liar to them. How could I tell him? I don't know what you said. Inside. Sit down over here. Yeah. Uh, right here? Yeah. <clears throat> I want a lawyer. You can have a million lawyers. I can't afford a million. All I want is one. All right, we'll call whatever lawyer you want. Tell them to be in felony court at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Felony court? That's downtown? 100 Center Street, criminal courts building. All right, talk to me after I talk to my lawyer. Right now, I got nothing to say. Well, uh, Leon had plenty to say. Well, that's his business. I don't care. He sure thinks a lot of you. I can't say vice versa. Thinks you're the most talented boy he knows. Doesn't think anybody can snap a lock on a car, get in, and jump the ignition as fast as you. Did he say that? Yeah. That's nice of him, you know. Said he can't think of a thief he'd rather work with. I didn't think Leon had a compliment in his body. Twelve seconds is your record. Nah. Break open the door, jump the ignition, start the car in twelve seconds. Nah, not twelve. I could maybe fifteen, not twelve. That's what he said. Uh, well, you know, Leon ain't no slouch either, you know. I uh-huh. know. Of course, I handled that caddy tonight, but I seen him turn some fast tricks, too. Ah, uh, between us, I guess we could get in almost any lock. Any lock. Oh, mm. Well, uh, we'll give you a new challenge, Ruby. Yeah, what's that? Sing Sing. You try the locks up there. By 8.45, no alarm had come through on the Cadillac sedan with Illinois license plates. Lieutenant King had been in touch with both the auto squad and the correspondence bureau of the central office. It was agreed that if the auto were not heard from within another hour, a telegram would be sent to the Illinois State Highway Patrol at Springfield with a request that the name of the owner be ascertained and a check made at the residence. Meanwhile, I was at the 17th Precinct Station House on East 51st Street. There, I entered in the blotter the results of my investigation of the injury to the motorcycle patrolman. I'd been to Bellevue Hospital and got a statement from both the officer and the doctor attending him. I'd seen the sector man and the sergeant who responded to the original call concerning the accident. In cases involving injury to a police officer in the line of duty... The manual of procedure requires a complete and immediate investigation of the facts by the commanding officer of the precinct or a captain on night duty in the division because of the possibility of sick leave with full pay and eventual disability retirement of the man. I returned to the 21st at 9.05 p.m. The car pulled up in front of the station house, and as I got out, I instructed the operator to pick up his partner and resume patrol. I crossed the sidewalk and started up the steps of the station house. Excuse me. Yes? This is the police station, isn't it? That's right, yes. Go ahead, Alicia. Seems nothing is safe anymore. Nothing. Thank you very much. What's the trouble, sir? Uh, Go ahead. Thank you. I uh, want to talk to the person in charge here. Well, I'm the captain in command of the precinct. Well, I do. I'm sorry I didn't see your insignia in the dark, didn't you? Oh, what an old, smelly building, Edward. Are the police stations in Chicago this old? How would I know? Captain, our car's been stolen. Oh, has it? Well, he just told you it had. Uh, What kind of car? A Cadillac sedan. You said you were from Chicago? Yes, that's right, Chicago. Captain, it's absurd the way criminals are allowed to run around on the streets in New York. To steal our car from practically under our nose. That's no way to treat visitors, is it? Well, sir, I, I don't think thieves stop to find out if their victim is a New Yorker or a visitor. They're out to steal, not discriminate. I don't believe you told me what your name was. Pryford. Edward J. Pryford. I'm Captain Kennelly. I'm Mrs. Pryford. How do you do? Mrs. Pryford. Well, if you're in charge, sir, how can we get some action? Our, our luggage was in the car, you know. We were leaving for Florida tonight, driving to Philadelphia tonight, starting out the first thing from there in the morning for Palm Beach. You have no idea what this does to our vacation. No idea. I can imagine, Mrs. Pryford. Uh, would you excuse me just a second? We're not going to get the runaround, are we? No, sir. I've got to go over to the desk and sign the blotter. Right. You just wait here. I'll be right back. Hello, Captain. Sergeant. A couple of messages for you. All right, I'll sign the blotter. Yes, sir. 
21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. What was that, mister? I didn't hear you. The bark and the what? Will you speak into the phone? Oh, he wouldn't sell you anymore, huh? No, there's nothing we can do to him. We ought to pin a medal on him. Well, you better not worry about drinking any more tonight. Better go on home and go to sleep. Yeah? Well, go on home and go to sleep. I'm sure you will. You got those messages, Sergeant? Yes, sir. I, uh... I saw those people hooked you as you came in the door, Captain. You want me to bail you out with them? No. No, thanks, Sergeant. This one, I want to handle myself. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. and Mrs. Bradford. We'll go upstairs to the detectives, all right? This way, please. A lot of good it'll do. The car's gone for good. It's gone, I know it's gone. And all my clothes with it. Fine place for decent people to come, New York. <laughs> uh, did you lock your car when you left it? Why, of course we locked it. Uh, through here, please. Oh, thank you. You know, even if it was locked, four suitcases on the back seat looked pretty attractive to thieves. It uh, was a sedan, you say? Four doors. You uh, might have locked three. Upstairs, please. I'm positive I locked all four doors. I always do. Uh-huh. Where was the car parked? On 61st Street near Park Avenue. After I finished some business, we checked out of the hotel. We were going to this restaurant, uh, Les Cargot. Uh, do you know it, Captain? Uh, I've been in there, yes. That way, please. The most absurd thing in the world. Just absurd. We'll never get anything back, anything. Right here. Oh, thank you. Mr. Pyreford? Uh, no protection. There's no police protection at all. Well, if that's a complaint, Mr. Pryford, you're talking to the wrong man. I'm responsible for the police protection here. You should complain about me, not to me. Maybe I will. Over here, please. Hey, Leon, here comes a Captain back again. Hi, Cap. Just sit there and be quiet. Are those men criminals? They're suspects, Mrs. Pryford. Oh. Novak, is Lieutenant King in? Yes, sir, he is. Thanks. Captain Canelli. Inside, please. Yes. This is Lieutenant King, Mr. and Mrs. Edward Pryford of Chicago, Illinois. Oh? How do you do? Mrs. Pryford. Lieutenant, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Pryford are looking for some fast action. Their car has been stolen. And uh, some luggage. I see. I don't know what we can expect, but I want to... Do you have the registration for your car, Mr. Pryford? Don't you believe that I own it? Oh, yes, I believe it. Just like to see your registration. <laughs> Gets to be a question of who gets investigated, the victims or the thieves. Oh. There you are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you mind looking on that table behind you? What? Is that your luggage? Edward, it is. Have you got the car, too? Yes, we've got it. But, uh, Edward, some of it's missing. There was more. The trunk, uh, in the trunk, there were three more bags. What about that? You've got the keys of the trunk in your pocket. We haven't touched it. The other bags are still in the luggage compartment. The car is not damaged, is it? No, not a scratch. Yeah, we've got the thieves. Those two boys outside oh, are selling. Yeah, well, but does everything look all right, Alicia? Oh, yes, I think so. I think so. Well, this vanity case has a little scratch on it. Oh, does it? I'm sorry. But it might have been there. Well, I, I suppose that covers everything. Not uh, quite everything, Mr. Pryvan. No? You might say thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Captain. We're really deeply obliged. You're welcome, Mr. Pryvan. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. What do you mean, robbed, lady? Held up? Oh, burglars. Well, when did this happen? During the night? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. The front door, huh? Well, what's the address there? Did you say 1405 or 1409? The candy store. Yeah. What do they and say? so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. 
The police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Ethel Everett, John Sylvester, Bill Lipton, Mandel Kramer, John Larkin, Wendell Holmes, and Harold Stone. Written and directed by Stanley Miss. Produced by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. listening, please visit otrcat.com. And now, speaking of New Year's resolutions, here's a poem for you, friends, to listen. When the year is at the morn, resolutions fine are born. When the year is old and gray, resolutions, where are they? I have the answer here to a season full of cheer. Just resolve to start each day happy, carefree, blithe, and gay. And you know, folks, all it takes to start the day is grape nuts flakes. That's the answer, all right. Eat a good breakfast, do a better job. Because you need an adequate breakfast after a fast of 10 or 12 hours the night before. In fact, dietitian tells us that morning is the time we should get at least one quarter of our entire day's nourishment. Yes, breakfast is the stoke-up meal. And grape nuts flakes are certainly a swell-tasting stoke-up food. They're a whole-grain cereal crammed full of all-around whole-grain nourishment. So for 1944, let's all resolve to eat a good breakfast do a better job. And let crisp, toasty brown grape nuts flakes help make it easy for you. You know, everybody's working at top speed these days. The times demand the best we've got. And the best, when it comes to coffee, is measured in terms of flavor. The demands we place upon coffee today are greater than ever before. Every cup must measure up. Every sip must hit the spot. Now, not only to fill its all-important place as part of a good meal, but for the boost fine coffee gives, the lift to help you get things done. And besides that, since the shortage makes rationing necessary, each cup should make up in excellence for the cups we don't get in between. Now, to fill the bill and more than fill it, get Chase and Sanborn coffee. You'll marvel that a single cup can hold so much delicious flavor. The secret is that Chase and Sanborn is more than one coffee. It's the finer ones blended. And today, our experts are turning out the richest, most satisfying, most flavorful blend of our entire history. You want all the flavor you can get, so get all the flavor you can. Every time you part with a precious ration coupon, ask for Chase and Sanborn. Naturally, nowadays, with so many others buying Chase and Sanborn, too, your grocer may sometimes run out. If he should, please understand and cooperate. And the next time... Be sure to ask again for Chase and Sanborn coffee. There's music in the air when the infant is nigh. 
And then this course you sing on the bright and laughing sky. Down our way, in the little town where a group of friends gather and practice old-fashioned singing. They have some mighty good times, and they'd like you to join them. This evening, as usual, they're gathered at the home of Eli and Jenny Jenkins. And in between songs, they'll have a chance to get caught up on all the latest happenings. Maybe some folks think that not much goes on in a little town. Well, if you just step into Eli's and Jenny's parlor, you can hear for yourself that there are mighty big happenings. And you'll hear it from the town's busiest body, Patience Peavoy. And I'm telling you, there ain't nothing ever been more of a surprise to me. Of course, we all knew that Alice was after that music scholarship. In fact, it was your idea, wasn't it, Eli? Sure it was. As leader of the singing group, maybe I appreciated Alice's pretty voice more than the rest of you. Yes, I remember the evening Eli first read about the scholarship being offered. He thought that Cliff and Alice both should try for it. Yes, and that hurts me, too. To think how Cliff would love to have gotten it. And then it had to be Alice who won it. Yeah, but you mustn't feel that way. It was a fair contest, and there was folks from all over the country competing for the prize. But Cliff and that beautiful tenor voice of his, he just ought to have gotten it. Besides, Alice had her school teaching job. Now, how could she just walk out on that? Well, she didn't, Patience. Of course she didn't. She come to the school board and asked if she could leave. And you're the school board. Hm. Seems like being town grocer would be enough. But you got to be sheriff and also the school board. And... Well, we got another teacher coming in this evening, and so we just dismissed class for a half day, and <laughs> we sure ain't making any of the kids mad by doing that. <laughs> you don't need to slide over it that way, Eli Jenkins. How do you know this new teacher is going to be good enough to take care of things? Why, I found out all about her. Her name is Marion Castle, and, 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 and she's a teacher. Just as I thought. Letting just anybody come in here. Well, you may be the school board, but I'm appointing myself a committee of one to go and find out about this new teacher. But patience. Oh, let her go ahead, Jenny. I guess I didn't do so much looking into things after all. It's nice of patience to want to do it for the good of the town. Yes, sirree, and that's the only reason I'm doing it. I want to make sure she's just the right teacher. There are a lot of things I want to find out about her, about her parents and her social activities and her experience as a teacher, and uh, and also it might be interesting to find out if she can sing. Huh? Well, what's that got to do with it? Oh, now I see. Well, you got to have a soprano for the singing group, don't you? Yeah. And if this new teacher can't sing, well, uh, I was just thinking that I'd be happy to oblige you and consider going back into the group like I was before Alice came along. <laughs> so that's what all this was about, huh? <laughs> it's beginning to make sense now. All right, Patience, you do your investigating, and if we find that she can't sing uh, any better than you, well, I guess the folks down our way will just have to take it. <laughs> being school teacher is a big responsibility anywhere. But being school teacher down our way carries an extra load because folks all expect that the new teacher will also be able to sing soprano with a group. That is, all the folks but patients hope for that. With patience, it's a different matter because she has some little ability as a singer herself. At least she thinks so. Well, uh, now that we're all gathered, I guess we better get to planning out what numbers we have to practice up for next week's activities. Don't you think so, Ben? How can we practice without a soprani? You can't have group singing without no soprani, can you, Cliff? No, that's impossible. That's what I say. All this is impossible. The way Alice run out on us. I knew from the first day she replaced me as soprani with the group that she was unstable. You mustn't say that. Alice had a good break, and I think it's wonderful that she took it. Hmm. I can think of a lot of singers that are much more deserving, but they've got to stay and run a gas station instead of going off to New York to study. I like running that gas station, and when I get ready, I'll go, bu I'll, I'll go to New York, too. Of course, Cliff. Now I think we'd better start with our practicing, like Eli says. We ain't got no soprani. How about the... <laughs> I'm right here, Ben. We still ain't got no soprani. Well, I never... Uh, ben, they say everything is comparative, so... Even though Patience ain't no Jenny Lynn, she comes nearer being a soprani than anybody else in the group. Well, my stars, doesn't anybody think I can sing? Now, don't go asking for it. You know, come to think of it, we gents ain't done a trio number for a long time. But there ain't no soprani part in that. No, you're getting an ID. What one do you want to practice, Pa? Oh, that sweet old one we picked for the Wednesday evening social, Jenny. All right, boys. Everybody got your books? That's on page 25. You got one. Everybody ready now. Tell me the 
tales that to me were so dear Long, long ago, long, long ago Sing me the songs I delighted to hear Long, long ago, long ago Now you are come, for oh, my grief is removed Let me forget that so long you have rolled Let me believe that you love as you loved Long, long ago, long ago Do you remember the path where we met Long, long ago charm to each word. Still my heart treasures the praises I heard. Long, long ago, long, long ago. I guess you don't know the way I can sing. Don't know it. Why, we haven't been able to escape it for 27 years. Did you find out anything about the new teacher inquiring around patients? Jenny, I found out everything. I've been asking all over, and I really got the lowdown. Oh, patience. You mean to tell me that you and the town gossips have gone to work on that poor girl even before she arrived? Well, that's a fine thing to say after me going to all this effort just for the good of the town. Besides, she ain't no girl. According to Mrs. Beasley, who had a cousin in Detroit who once had a friend who knew Marion Castle. Well, she's a woman of uh, 46, about my age. Well, uh, which? Well, what do you mean, which? Which is she, 46 or a woman of your age? Now, how can you be so nasty, Ben Potts? Now, now, let's go on with finding out about this new teacher. Yeah, what else did Mrs. Beasley say? Well, she's been teaching for 25 years and always specialized in gym and sports. Hmm? Yes, Mrs. Beasley says she has absolutely no talent for the arts. Oh, oh, I see. And then I got to Mrs. McElroy. She was awful busy, but she took time out to tell me what she's heard about this new teacher. Well, knowing Mrs. McElroy, she'll never be too busy to do that. And according to Mrs. Peters, Miss Castle lived in Cincinnati and is just out of teacher's college. This is her first job. She says she's a math major, loves arithmetic. But unfortunately, she's uh, tone deaf. So now we know all about Miss Castle. She's between 19 and 46 and has never before taught school. Or maybe she's been teaching for 25 years. She specializes in either gym or arithmetic. And she lived in Detroit, unless it was Cincinnati. Uh, and uh, ain't it peculiar that the only thing they all agree on is that she's got no talent for music? And probably ain't even got any vocal cords. Yes, that's according to rumors. Well, Patience, instead of me offering you the soprani part with a group on a silver platter, uh, before we've even seen the new teacher, uh, why don't we sort of wait and let the best woman win? That is, if you're not afraid of competition. Me? I can hold my own against any woman. Well, that's foolhardy courage if I ever heard it. Jumping catfish, look at what time it is. We've been sitting here speculating about the new teacher for so long that I plumb forgot she's arriving in six minutes. Well, you can still make it, Pa. Cut through the lot, and there's no more than a block to the depot. Well, you don't think that you're going alone to meet her, do you? Gee, horse of it. Why, that ain't no hospitality. Well, and the school board ain't a Ben. Yep, one by one, they all died off and left you the only one. And now you won't appoint no new members. Well, whether I'm in it or not, I got a right to go meet her in my capacity as volunteer fire chief. Yeah, now give me one good reason why the volunteer fire chief should be on the welcoming committee for the new teacher. But how can you alone be a committee? Oh, stop arguing and let Ben go with you, Eli. And you'd both better hurry or she'll be left with nobody to welcome her. Where's Cliff? He went out on the porch. Well, we should make a good impression on her, and that sure ain't assured with those two old... What in tarnation are you in for? Get on, Eli, and you too, Ben. I don't think Cliff is in any frame of mind to be welcoming the person who will take Alice's place. 
Here it comes now. It could get a move on, Ben. I can't be a hurrying with my rheumatism the way I suffer. Have I got symptoms? Say, did I tell you about the hot flashes I had? I feel mighty sorry for Cliff. You know, he was right fond of Alice. Yes, the poor boy. Uh, why don't we try to get him in here and sympathize with him? Well, that sure wouldn't help him any. But we might ask him to come in and practice his solo. That'd take his mind off and things for a while. Cliff! Cliff, boy, could you all go over your solo now? All right, Mrs. Jenkins. He was out there looking so lonesome. I think they'll make it to the station before the train pulls in. I watched them as far as I could see in the dark. Uh, I guess they'll be back here before long, then. We'd better get this practiced up. Uh, do you want to do two a wire rolls for the young people's get-together? Yeah, I guess so. Doesn't matter much. Oh, now, don't get to feeling that away, Cliff. Of course things matter, even if Alice did run off. Shall I play it in G-flat, Cliff? That's good. Come, oh songs, come, oh dreams, soft the gates of day close. Sleep, my bird, sleep, dreams, sleep, my wild rose. Pool and bud, hill and deep, you who warm my we interrupted. Well, thank you. Uh, I was just finishing. But the way you sustained that portamento. Oh, uh, I'm not in good voice tonight. Uh, if uh, I might interrupt this little conflab for a minute, I'd like to introduce our new teacher. <laughs> I'm sorry. I let my enthusiasm run away with me. When I hear such beautiful music, why, I even forget my manners. Well, everybody, this is Marion Castle. How do you do? Oh, Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> yeah, this is my wife, Jenny. This patient's P-boy, and that voice you, that took your fancy there belongs to Cliff Tyler. <laughs> How do you do, all of you? I'm happier than I, I can say to be here. Well, you're being so helpful to come on short notice this way. Our other teacher had to leave in quite a hurry. And... Yeah, she went and won a scholarship and went off without giving a thought to nobody. Uh, won't you sit down and here? Uh, let me take your things. Eli, put her bags in the closet there for the time being until she gets settled. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm afraid they're quite heavy. Yes, uh, Eli picked up the light one. I got this one that's solid lead. I guess it does feel like it. Are you from Detroit or Cincinnati, Miss Castle? Oh, neither. I'm from San Francisco. One strike. And is this your first teaching job? No. I've been at the West Gramercy Grade School for five years. I left there only last semester. Two strikes. And she ain't neither 1946 nor your age, Patience. 
That makes three strikes and you're out. Oh, hush up, Ben. You still ain't covered one point. Yeah, you're taking quite a big job here. There's some ornery kids in this town. Now, Eli, don't try to frighten her away. We got some mighty fine youngsters. Oh, yeah. oh I don't frighten easily. We manage to have lots of fun, especially with our little singing group here. Oh, this is the group. Sure, and Eli here is the leader. Oh, yes, I knew all that. Yes, sir, we have lots of fun. Sing at all the important events down our way. Uh, yes, and there's just one thing left to be settled. You see, the teacher who just left... Well, Miss Castle a... knows that the teacher just left. Otherwise, she wouldn't be here. But that wasn't what I was about to say. You see... The... I think the best way to introduce Miss Castle to our group is to sing something for her. What's old Eli done that he's trying to cover up on? But, Pa, we got all the songs practiced up. Oh, we can get an extra one ready, can't we, Ma? Besides, this is a special occasion. We won't do this number for rehearsal. This is a special performance for our charming new teacher. <laughs> well, what a kind thought. I'd love to hear you. Hey, you got some music handy there, Jenny? Uh, how about this one, Pa? Uh, shall I sing the soprani part? Uh, yeah, I, I know. Uh, how about Miss Castle singing along with us? Uh, would you do that, Miss Castle? Uh, would you try singing soprani? Why, well, of course. I thought that was all. Uh, you will do it? You're fine. Hey, come on now. Gather around. But everybody. how about me? Don't yeah, I get hurry you? Up, Moss, hey, right what is this? I thought we were supposed to be singing for Miss Castle. Is he going to sing with us? Be quiet, Cliff. I'm having enough trouble wangling this without you interfering. Say, that's a mighty fine voice, Miss Castle. It, would, would you oblige us with a little solo? Well, I really didn't know oh, anything about it. yes, that would be fine. Yeah. Why, of course. Um, shall we take it from here? Oh, no, let's start at the beginning. Beautiful dreamer, wake on. Why, Miss Castle, you sang that just like one of them real professional singers. <laughs> well, I, I hope it sounds professional. Didn't you know, Mr. Uh, Jones? We know that it sounded mighty pretty. Uh, say, Patience, you know what I think would be awful good about now? Some of your hot chocolate. I bet Miss Castle ain't never tasted hot chocolate like you may. Uh, you just go right out in the kitchen, make yourself at home. Well, I'm glad to think I can do something. The very idea. I never even had a chance. She just come in and took over, and all the time Eli was encouraging her. 
Well, Ben, ain't you even going to come and help me like you usually do? Oh, I guess you can't get out of it, but I assure you I won't put on an apron. This is the nicest surprise I can imagine to find that you are a real musician. Well, I... Now, don't I... deny it. I know a good singer when I hear one. I guess I, I, I've always loved music. Eli so Jenkins, much, I ain't I been married to you for 32 years without knowing when there's some scheme going on in that head of yours. Who, me? That innocent look ain't fooling me none. Now tell me, what kind of conniving's been going on here? Well, did you really think that Eli, the school board, was going to hire a teacher that would not be able to help Eli, the, the, the leader of the singing group? Uh-huh, just as I suspected. After all, Jenny, I got an obligation to this here town. As, as singing master, I supply the music. As school board, I hire the teachers. And as sheriff, I protect the people. And if I let patients get in with her screechy soprani, well, I sure wouldn't be protecting nobody. <laughs> <laughs> you old darling. I should have known you were taking no chances. But why didn't you let me know you were hiring a teacher that sings? My gray hair's got grayer worrying about it. Uh, look at Cliff and Miss Castle sitting over there. Look kind of like they belong together, don't they? I'm so glad Cliff took a fancy to Yeah, her. and she noticed him, too, now. Don't you worry. <laughs> Say, you know more about music than a professor. I'll have to keep on my toes. I yeah, sure know how to pick teachers, don't it, Cliff? You sure do. And the greatest coincidence is that she can sing soprano. <laughs> coincidence? Why, that was one of the first qualifications that was yeah, required. Now, let's not uh, be going on about this. Uh... Oh, now I get it. <laughs> Say, that's great. Leave it to Eli. Am I missing something? Well, Marion, if I may call you that. Oh, please do. As I started to say, there are always little intimate things you have to learn about a town before you can really appreciate what goes on. Now, one of these days, when you're familiar with what goes on behind the scenes down our way, you'll be able to really appreciate this. This seems pretty mysterious, but I'll have to wait and learn for myself, I guess. Oh, Pa, I forgot. We still haven't practiced that hymn for next Sunday services. Uh, would you like to be a permanent part of our singing group, Miss Castle? We have a lot of fun doing it, and the folks all seem to enjoy our efforts. Well, I'd be delighted. Good. I I've never wanted to make a career out of singing, but, well... I hope that the day never comes when I can't be joining in some kind of musical activity. Oh, gee, that's swell. Well, we'd be mighty honored to have you with us. Uh, ben, can you leave your cooking long enough to practice with us for a minute? Doggone it. Whatever I do, I get insulted. If I don't help patients, I'm being mean. <laughs> and when I do help her, I'm, I'm sneered at. Oh, Eli was only fooling Ben. Let's turn to page 96 now, and let's all do real good. Well, I ain't in the best of boys. I slept in a stable last night. So I woke up this morning a little horse. <laughs> ain't that clever? Stable, horse, he get it? <laughs> Sound the chord, Jenny. There ain't no coping with Ben when he's trying to be funny. All together now, everybody. <clears throat> a pleasure. 
living here and having all of you as friends. Well, here's the chocolate, everybody. Come and get your own. Well, Miss Castle... <laughs> Uh, Please make it Marion. Well, Marion, you say it's going to be pleasant for you. Well, let me tell you that your coming in this evening and fitting into things so nicely has meant a lot to us. Uh, we were feeling pretty lonesome without Alice, but now you've come along and we can say to ourselves that if Alice never left, we wouldn't have met you. If folks would always just remember that sometimes if it wasn't for the bad things... We'd never know the good things. It just let a little, little time pass, and then you can stand off and look at what happened. <laughs> and usually you can say to yourself, it was all for the best. There's music in So the new teacher takes her place in the little town down our way, and events settle back to their peaceful pattern. She'll never quite take Alice's place, it's true, but we have a feeling that she'll make a place all her own. We'll be able to know more about that when you drop in to sing and practice again next week. See you then. Down Our Way is written by Shirley Thomas and produced by Walter White, Jr. The blood crisis is not yet past. The Defense Department still needs vast supplies of blood and blood plasma. These materials, for which there are no substitutes whatsoever, are saving the lives of our wounded men in military hospitals and of civilians here at home. Every American soldier who is wounded in battle needs the equivalent of nine pints of blood. So the continuing drain on supplies is obvious. In addition to these current demands, it's absolutely necessary that we set up a national stockpile of plasma to meet any emergency which might arise. We need such a reserve in case the Cold War should lead to an enemy attack on our shores. More than that, every disaster, fire, flood, explosion, or earthquake takes its toll. It takes a little time to give your pint of blood. Simply call your local Red Cross chapter for an appointment. The Red Cross handles the National Blood Program, which aims to supply the total blood needs of the country, civilian and military, current and reserve. Every type of blood is needed, and to meet the demand, Americans are rolling up their sleeves. Today, there's a continuing lineup of great radio shows on this NBC station with a variety of entertainment features. Later this afternoon, Best Plays will present The Philadelphia Story, Philip Barry's highly successful comedy of manners. Starring in The Philadelphia Story on Best Plays will be Betty Furness, Joan Alexander, and Myron McCormick. In the music department this afternoon, you're invited to keep tuned for a full-hour concert from world-famed Hollywood Bowl. Today's concert will feature Dorothy Warren Scholl, Jan Pierce, and Igor Gorin. Another highly entertaining program today on NBC will be broadcast from Meredith Wilson's Music Room. Meredith will have lovely Esther Williams as his special guest. And I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing them talk about music, swimming, and anything else that happens to pop up in the course of their informal conversation. So for the finest in radio entertainment, be sure to keep tuned to the NBC Radio Network. Over NBC's coast-to-coast -coast network of independent and affiliated stations, the University of Chicago Roundtable. Today, the Roundtable is privileged to present a special program from the Second International Symposium on Feelings and Emotions, which is meeting on the campus of the University of Chicago and which is co-sponsored by the Loyal Order of Moose and the University of Chicago. The roundtable subject, Emotions and World Problems. This is the problem. What practical effectiveness can this research have in delivering mankind from the menace of war? What can the latest scientific research on emotional problems and feelings contribute to our understanding of war? The printed pamphlet of today's discussion of emotions and world problems will include the notable exchange of letters between Professor Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud on Why War? Send 10 cents to the University of Chicago Roundtable for your copy of this pamphlet, including the letters of Professor Einstein and Freud. 
To introduce today's roundtable discussion, we present James G. Miller, chairman of the Department of Psychology of the University of Chicago. Dr. Miller. Today's roundtable participants are members of an international group representing world thought on recent advances in understanding human feelings and emotions. There has been rapid advance in the sciences of man, the psychological and sociological sciences. Many people have the impression that the imponderable and unsubstantial matters like the mind and human feelings cannot be dealt with scientifically. But we believe it is important to investigate human emotions as precisely and impartially as any other problem of science. During the last few days in our international symposium on feelings and emotions at Mooseheart and on the campus of the University of Chicago, over 2,000 scientists from a dozen countries have discussed the many new advances in such research. Scientists from four countries, representing different traditions, speaking with different accents, and yet trying in common to understand these common problems which have such vital concern for all of us in the present grave world situation, join us in today's roundtable. I should like to ask you, the listener, to try to understand the natural divergences of attitudes of our speakers and to comprehend nevertheless, despite this, how they all and all of us can work dispassionately in world unity on such issues. Joining me in this roundtable discussion of emotions and world problems are Dr. Lambert Vanderhorst, child psychiatrist of Amsterdam, Holland, Professor Robert H. Thalas, psychologist in the Department of Education, Cambridge University, England, Dr. Joseph Newton, psychologist and priest of the University of Louvain, Belgium, and Professor Gardner Murphy, psychologist of City College of New York and former president of the American Psychological Association. Professor Tholos, what is your view of the importance of the study of emotional patterns as a contribution to international relations and the problem of war? Well, I'd like to talk about the part that language plays in creating feelings of hostility between nations. The effect of language on people's thinking is a question I've been interested in for some years. I've written some books about it, and I've just read a paper about it to our symposium on feelings and emotions. Yes, and Father Nutin, how do you view the problem of solving tensions among nations? Well, the general attitude in Europe at the present time is one of great skepticism about the effectiveness of psychological studies in solving political problems. It's the political attitudes of the leaders, often relatively few leaders, that matter. The common attitude is that these are political and not scientific problems. And what is your personal point of view on this? Well, I have done some research on emotional attitudes and hostility feelings. And I should like to stress that we have to consider chiefly the intellectual or rational basis which gives rise to such feelings. What one nation knows or thinks it knows about another is an important source of emotional attitude. And therefore, I think that the major factor in improving our emotional attitudes will be the improvement of our knowledge about each other. Dr. Van der Horst, you're one of the outstanding child psychiatrists of Holland. What is your area of particular concern in the matter of understanding world tensions? I was always interested in the analysis of the individual feelings and in the way specific elements can build up complicated human emotions as hate and hostility. And Professor Murphy, what is your particular interest in this problem? In our laboratory at City College, New York, we have been studying for some years specific ways in which emotion and personal needs can influence perception, learning, memory, and thinking. Professor Tholos, I'd like to have some more of your point of view on this matter 
of the control of emotions, in particular the relationship of emotion to language. Well, I'm not inclined to think that a very important factor in driving nations to war is what people call human aggressiveness. It isn't the case that men want to go to war. They go out to wars unwillingly to defend their country when wars break out. When wars break out for such reasons, for example, as the conflicts of national interests, which haven't very much to do with psychology. Wars don't break out because men have a feeling of aggressiveness that drives them to fight. Well, if not, why do you think they do? Why wars do break out? Well, I think, as I say, such things as conflicts of national interests. But men get no real satisfaction to their aggressiveness out of modern war. Why don't they? Well, the, the conditions of war have changed. You probably, if you felt aggressive, got some kick out of hitting your enemy over the head with a battle axe. But you don't get any satisfaction out of the elaborate manipulation of a gun or semi-automatic plotting machine, which is what you have to do nowadays. But where psychology does enter in is in the creation of all those irrational forces that lead men to look at the enemy as somebody altogether hateful and their own cause as something altogether just. And one way of making people irrational is the emotional use of language. That is, using words to call up feelings instead of to convey information. Can you give any illustration of how that happens? Well, we can take an example of a speech, very good speech, made by one of the leaders during the last war. It ran like this. Hitler and his Nazi gang have sown the wind. Let them reap the whirlwind. Neither the length of the struggle nor any form of severity which it may assume will make us weary or will make us quit. These gangs of bandits have sought to darken the light of the world have sought to stand between the common people of all the lands and their march forward to their inheritance. Well, that's the kind of thing I mean by the emotional use of language. It isn't conveying any information. It's just calling up strong feelings. And I have no quarrel with it there. It happened during a war. If you have wars at all, you have to stir up people's feelings, and the use of emotional language is a way to do it makes men efficient soldiers, it doesn't make them think sensibly. The real danger is going on using such language in peacetime to stir up hostile feelings against other nations. As soon as we start thinking of or talking about any other national group as gangs of bandits or some such way, we've taken a step towards war. How are we going to be able to keep from this? Well, I'm not against the idea of reducing people's aggressiveness as much as the psychotherapists, such as Professor Fendelhorst, can do it. But I think we also have to take steps to abolish people's tendency to become irrational under the influence of emotional language. As to how? By education. That's by teaching people when they hear emotional oratory that carries them away, to put into their own minds neutral words which don't carry strong feelings, and then they can see exactly how much real sense there is in the oratory which has moved them so much. Yes, indeed, Professor Thawis, and I'm going to turn to Father Nutin. Professor Nutin, as Professor of Social Psychology, you have investigated the attitudes of Europeans toward each other. What matters would you stress particularly in this area? I can best give you, I think, an example of what I mean. In my country, indeed, I made an investigation about the emotional attitudes of high school boys towards the Dutch people. And I found that a lot of these boys manifested feelings of contempt and hostility towards our neighbors. Continuing this investigation, I was surprised to see that several boys gave up mainly historical reasons to motivate their hostility feelings. It was because a hundred years ago the neighbor people tried to dominate our country that the boys did not like them. And on this basis 
all kind of unfriendly traits of character were attributed to them. I talked about this question with the teacher, and now I found that the course in history given to the boys ended with a vivid description of the revolution of our people against the neighbor people a hundred years ago, but about the friendly relationships between the two peoples in the more recent years, nothing was told. Why was that? Well, I think that it is not very reasonable to feel contempt or hostility against other people for historical reasons. And this is an example of emotional attitudes which can be improved by improving educational methods in providing knowledge and information. And I do not mean at all that historical truth must be blurred, but historical, blurred. But historical truth must be told in constructive ways. And therefore, friendly and cultural relationships, which make peoples growing closer together, must be stressed rather than omitted. And you think that if these friendly relationships are stressed, that the emotions of the people will be more properly directed toward world peace? I think so. And it is not only the case for high school boys, but also for adults. And perhaps I should like to add that the same thing can be said about the daily course in history, which is given by our newspapers. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn to... Dr. Vanderhorst, a moment or two ago, Professor Thalas mentioned psychotherapists and their attitudes toward aggression. Now tell me, Dr. Vanderhorst, what is known about the psychology of hate and hostility? Hate and hostility belong to the complicated feelings in which different elements work together. And one of the most fundamental factors is what Dr. Taulis mentioned, the aggressive attitude. If our frustration does intensify the aggressive attitude, Dr. Van der Horst, does it always beget hostility? Not necessarily. Feelings like hate and hostility appear when we add the human element. The human element. If you should like to know what I mean, then I mention the words of Nietzsche. We make war because we are murderers in our inner selves. There is in each human being an inborn disposition to tragedy, to pain and evil, to disrespect, to devalue others. In union with the aggressive drive, this may lead to war and destruction. So, the big question is, if there is a very strong aggressive drive or not. In other words, I gather that you think aggression is valuable to an extent, but if it goes too far, it is dangerous. Then it is dangerous. Our judgment of this drive depends upon different circumstances. Well, tell me, Dr. Van der Horst, how do emotions becloud rational processes? In violent emotions, there are two possibilities. Two possibilities in behavior, as we can see it in animals. First, a total paralysis. The second possibility is a lot of desperate movements. The same holds for rational processes. Whether rational behavior is blocked, or whether thoughts are crowded, without any dominant idea. What suggestions do you have, Dr. Van der Horst, as to methods which might be used to control hostility? If we are to prevent war and hostility, we have first to discover how far our own lives are motivated by violent, aggressive drives. And secondly, we must be aware of the human tendency to disrespect and to devalue other human beings. <clears throat> the aggressive drive is intensified by frustration. 
For example, the frustration child, the frustrated child tries to re reestablish his lost balance. In his effort to satisfy his drives, he forms bad habits, which in the end will bring him to an unsocial life. And you think that something can be done to prevent frustration and so prevent aggression? Yes, we need to prevent frequent frustration and to teach the child to value each human being. In this way, perhaps hostility and war can belong to the past. Thank you, Dr. Van der Horst. And now, Professor Murphy, we've heard from an Englishman, a Belgian, and a Dutchman. What do you, as an American scientist, have to say about these questions? Well, going back to Father Nutan's comment about European skepticism as to what can be done by psychological research in relation to politics, I think it would be fair to say that progress in such matters inevitably comes very slowly. Yet American politics has actually been influenced somewhat by the studies of political scientists. And our own war effort was influenced by public opinion studies and by studies of leadership. Even if our contribution is small now, I'd say let's do what we can and hope that as the years roll on, they will make a huge difference. Yes. Well, now we have had various points of view suggested and various types of research mentioned for investigating these problems. We've had a discussion of the relation between emotions and language. We've had a discussion about how people can be educated to interpret their own history and to view it in terms of factual knowledge rather than in terms of emotion. Dr. Vanderhorst has mentioned the role of rearing of children and aggression uh, in the question of uh, prevention of aggressive attitudes in adults. And Professor Murphy has referred to various researches that are being done in America in the question of relations between people. Now, we have all this knowledge and a great deal more, which has been discussed in these days of our symposium here. Why is it, and I want to address this to all of you gentlemen, why is it that we have not been able to make practical application of these bits of knowledge that we have at the present time? Why is it that we not yet do have the promise of world peace, and what do you think can be done practically to bring it about? Well, I should like to give an answer yes, to your Professor question. Nutan. I think that most of the researches done in this field are still in an experimental stage. The results obtained are still incomplete and do not yet present concrete solutions of the complex problems we find in international life, I think. And Dr. Van der Horst, do you have any comments on this? Yes. I agree with Dr. Nutten. We um, have to do with very complicated feelings, and we start to analyze the feelings. But we always have to take in our account that... Um, if, for instance, we are speaking about aggression, we need a certain amount of aggression. So it is always difficult uh, to uh, have the practice consequence of it. What would you have to say about this, Professor Murphy, about this general issue that we're discussing now is what can be done practically to make this science effective? It seems to me that we put a premium on emotional fireworks in our discussion of international affairs and often, instead of lacking information, fail to apply what is evident from on the basis of research. A man can have a strong determination to defend what he believes and yet keep his head at the same time. But our social habit, for example, in political life, is to cut loose with invective and emotional orgies of name-calling. Just as happens between two men, each party to the dispute inflames the other. Professor Thomas, do you have anything to add? Yes, well, it seems to me there's a great flood of unreasonableness. The forces opposed to it sometimes seem to be weak, 
But I think it all really starts in school. We can teach children to talk sensibly and not emotionally about other people, to take other people's point of view, and generally to make good world citizens. And I think what we have to remember in school and elsewhere is that war is not the only problem. The problem is all these irrational hate attitudes towards other human groups. That's between white and colored people, between Anglo-Saxons and South Europeans, and between Gentiles and Jews. And our aim isn't merely to avoid wars, it's to establish the brotherhood of all men. You're speaking about these irrational attitudes between various nations. Father I remember that some years ago, the relations between Belgium and Holland were more strained than they are at the present time. What has been done to improve this situation? Well, I think that the fact that since the war, a lot of university professors were visiting our country and that our university professors were visiting uh, Holland, that so by improving our mutual knowledge, knowledge in uh, Belgium about Holland and in Holland about Belgium, that that was one of the important factors in improving the good, the good relations about the two peoples. Well, Dr. Van der Horst, you're a Dutchman. Now, you have been on the other side of it. Yes. I agree with Dr. Nutten. Before the last World War, we didn't know much from the people in Belgium. And now, after the war, the universities of Belgium came with help to us, and we came in touch with You the gave people. mutual assistance each to the other. Yes, mm -hmm. and now there is also more appreciation. Mm -hmm. We know each other, and we know the ideas, and all, also the difficulties we had before the war. Well, that exactly was what I mean, that better information, better knowledge can improve our emotional attitudes toward each other. And now I understand that it's possible for the University of Louvain, your university, Dr. Nutin, to give an honorary degree to the Queen of Holland, something which wouldn't have been possible perhaps a few years ago. That's right. And we were very glad that it was possible for, before the war, we had no contact with the University of Louvain. We came from time to time to Brussels, but we went to Paris. We went to Geneva. We never came to Louvain. After the war, it was the University of Louvain who came first to Amsterdam. And so we get in touch with the University of Louvain, and we could appreciate it. We had a very interesting illustration in this symposium of how emotions becloud even the thinking of scientists. We made every effort we could to have a Russian scientist come to discuss the matter of emotions, and yet it was impossible to get a representative from the Soviet. However, we did find that the attitude of the Soviet toward the question of scientific investigation of the emotions is very different from the attitude of Americans and Europeans generally, because there, in Russia, they feel that the political point of view of the scientists, their own value systems, affect the scientific investigations, and it is impossible to be objective about these matters. Therefore, they say that unless you have the same sort of philosophical background as they have in Russia, and we do not in capitalist countries, it would be impossible for us to communicate uh, on these matters. Do you think that that's true, Professor Murphy? I don't think we have a broad enough factual basis of understanding Russian cultural conditions to judge that immediately. But I would like to suggest the things that, from our side, I think we can do. There are at least six of them. First, we can get our information from many sources. And by us, you mean every lay citizen? I mean citizen. absolutely everybody, everybody. And test that material for objectivity. Second, one can make a habit of reading biography, history, or fiction about people who seem strange to us until we learn to see what the world looks like through their eyes. Third, we can try our hands at predicting, month by month, 
what we think will happen in international relations, recording the predictions, and ruthlessly checking up on our errors, gradually learning by tough experience where our biases are crippling our judgment. What other methods can be used? Well, I think that as you follow a controversy in the press or over the air, you can identify yourself by turns with each contestant instead of taking sides at the beginning. That is, without giving up your own values and ideals, you can learn to see by turns how it looks to each person. Fifth, you can take time to study the historical and cultural background from which each phase of international relations follows. So, instead of a sense of arbitrariness, you will see the logic of events. For example, you will see the forces that push Vyshinsky or Molotov and are perhaps less likely to be content with a cliché that the man is simply obstinate. Along these lines, I would emphasize especially the objective studies of national character that are now being made at the great university centers. Not in terms of good and bad, but in terms of cultural diversities. And finally, it seems to me that the light must be thrown upon ourselves with exactly the same objectivity. Our own American national culture and character must be studied objectively by scholars both from our own and from other lands, so that ultimately there will be an international science and human relations will be one of the subject matters of such an international science. Thank you. And that exactly is what we have been doing in this symposium and today. A few of the many techniques of the sciences of man have been discussed by us here, along with their possible applications both by the leaders of our nations and the world and by each individual citizen. The important matter on which we can all agree is that there is and can be a community of world scientists who, though with different viewpoints, nevertheless can work together objectively and unemotionally studying human emotions and their effects on world affairs. Greatly increased public support is needed for these areas of research because they are coping with the questions of primary world importance today. The two billion dollar questions. How can we keep man from pushing the buttons that will start the push-button war? How can we assure ourselves of enduring world peace? Thank you, gentlemen. You have been listening to the University of Chicago Roundtable discuss emotions and world problems with L. Vanderhorst, child psychiatrist of Amsterdam, Holland, Robert H. Thalys, psychologist, Cambridge University, England, Joseph Newton, psychologist and priest, University of Louvain, Belgium, Gardner Murphy, psychologist of City College of New York, and James G. Miller, Chairman of the Department of Psychology of the University of Chicago, as participants. This week's roundtable pamphlet includes the full text of today's discussion and the notable exchange of letters between Professor Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud on Why War? You'll want to send 10 cents to the University of Chicago roundtable, Chicago 37, Illinois, to receive this important pamphlet and to find out what Sigmund Freud says about the hopes of mankind for ridding the world of war. For $3, you may subscribe to the pamphlet for a full year and receive 52 weekly issues. I'll repeat the address. The University of Chicago Roundtable, Chicago 37, Illinois. Today's roundtable originated in the Mitchell Tower Studios of the University of Chicago. No matter what your favorite entertainment is, you'll always find it on the Maxwell House Showboat. The ticket of admission, as always, just your loyalty to Maxwell House Coffee. Tonight, guests of the showboat, I'd like to put on a little scene concerning something we've been talking about ever since hot weather began. The friendly stimulation of a tall, tinkling glass of iced Maxwell House Coffee. As our curtain rises, we see a golfer step inside his front door at home. His wife calls to him. Well, dear, how was your game? Pretty hot day, wasn't it? Mm, hot is right. And the game just so so as usual. Oh, goodness, Mary, I feel all in. Tired. And those last two holes took everything I had. Even the shower didn't seem to help much. 
I guess I'll just sit down in the easy chair and rest a bit. I thought you'd be feeling kind of low and played out here. So well, I'm repeating the wholesome little ceremony you liked so much last week. Yeah, what's that? Mm, the most refreshing drink there is. This will boy you up all right. And afterwards, I'm sure you'll feel that your exercise was well worthwhile. Here you are. Yeah. Ice Maxwell House coffee, huh? Mm-hmm. Tell you, Mary, this certainly does hit the spot. Certainly. And ladies and gentlemen, in golf and tennis clubs, around swimming pools, in the locker rooms of the baseball parks, at the beaches, wherever people are active this summer, you'll find a growing custom. People are drinking iced Maxwell House coffee. And you'll enjoy it, too, whenever you need refreshment. A cooling drink of iced Maxwell House coffee with its friendly stimulation that buoys you up and never lets you down. Amazing, Wilcox, amazing. What's so amazing, Senator? Your victory in the election. Uh, my candidate's victory, Senator, the famous Autolite Stay Full Battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Why, everybody voted for the Autolite Stay Full Battery. You had plenty in reserve, Wilcox. Reserve? Why, the Autolite Stay Full Battery has over three times the liquid reserve of batteries without Stay Full features. Didn't you campaign with fiberglass retaining mats? Sure did, Senator, because every positive plate of the Autolite Stay Full Battery is protected with a fiberglass retaining mat to prevent shedding and flaking and keep the power-producing materials in place. Why, your candidate is in for life, Wilcox. A uh, longer life, Senator, because the Autolite Stay Full Battery gives 70% longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to SAE minimum life cycle standards. So, friends, get acquainted with the Autolite Stay Full Battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. See your neighborhood Autolite battery dealer now. And remember... You're always right with Autolite. Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Now, this is Art Price, International Press Service. Oh, holy smoke, Art. What are you doing up at this hour of the morning? I'm on the night desk, and I'm sorry to have to wake you up. So am I. Listen, I just got a call, a real frantic one, from a guy who insisted on having your phone number. Well, did you give it to him? He said he's an insurance man, and it was about some insurance matter, so... Yes, I did. Well, why'd he call you? Yeah, that puzzles me, too, but he was so excited, so, well, so frantic. Well, he probably called the first person he could think of, and he said it was a big emergency. Oh, did he give you any details? No. And, Johnny, it's aroused my curiosity. Well, let me know what it's all about, will you? Yeah, sure, sure. Promise? Okay, I promise. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. The State Unity Life Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the ghost-to-ghost matter. I'd no sooner rolled over in the hope of getting back to sleep when the phone beside my bed started jangling again. Oh, nuts. Johnny Dollar. uh, This is Oscar H. Trimley, Mr. Dollar. Trimley? I represent State Unity Live here in Lake City, New Jersey. Oh, look, are you the man who called Art Price over at International Press Service? Yes, yes, I did to get your phone number. I I knew knew he'd have it, you're being such a famous investigator and all that. Yeah, well, you could also have got it from Universal Adjustment Bureau, your insurance director, the long-distance operator. Oh, dear, I I guess I've been so upset over this whole thing that it's never occurred to me, but... uh, can you come down here to Lake City, Mr. Dollar, right away? Well, it depends. What's this all about? Ian McAndrews. Who's Ian McAndrews? Oh, don't you know? He's the man who founded Lake City. So what's happened to him? Uh, he, he's dead, Mr. Dollar. Or rather, he isn't. Uh, huh? Well, that is to say, he, he died, Mr. Dollar, about uh, five years ago. And? Well, uh, in due time, of course, we paid off the claim on his life insurance policy, $55,000. Everything in order and perfectly all right. Well, then? But now... Oh, oh no, Mr. Dollar, you, you just won't believe it unless you come here and see for yourself. Oh, won't believe what? Ian McAndrews has come back. Huh? Either he or his... his ghost has come back here. Oh, now, wait a no, minute. No, no, it's true, it's absolutely true, sir. Ian McAndrews is haunting Lake City, so please come as quickly as you can. I, uh... 
I'll think about it. Oh, dear. Is that the best answer you can give me? Yeah, I'm afraid so, until I see how things line up for me these next couple of days. Goodbye, Mr. Trimley. Think about it. I could hardly wait to grab a train. But I didn't want Oscar Trimley to know that. Because I had a strong suspicion that if you can catch a ghost off guard, you'll be one up on it. Expense account item one, the promised phone call to Art Price and International Press. Are you kidding, Johnny? No, I'm deadly serious, Art. But a ghost in the little New Jersey. Yeah, yep, I'll keep in touch. Then I remembered Nancy. Nancy Turner, an old flame. Or rather, a young old flame. She said something one time about taking up investigation of the supernatural. So, expense account item two, another dime for another call. You old rascal, Johnny, you haven't called me in ages. Well, you know how it is. Uh, look, Nancy, did you ever go ahead with your study of psychic investigation? Psychic? Oh, no, Johnny. I found I'd have to read a couple of hundred musty old books, so I gave it up. Oh, well, that's too bad. Oh, why? Well, I, I've got to run over to Jersey to investigate a haunted town. A haunted town? How Except that such a thing is impossible. Oh, it is? Sure. But I I kind of thought that maybe you were still... Well, I guess we better forget it. Forget it? Nothing. I'm going with you. Oh, no. Now, wait. I... No excuses. I'll put on my face and another dress and be waiting by the time you can get here. Yeah, but look, honey, I... Mom? Johnny. Okay, Nancy. I'll pick you up. <laughs> Item three, 1085, taxi and train for two to New York. Item four, 50 bucks, deposit on a rental car when we got into Grand Central Station. We crossed over into Jersey and hit Route 22 for Somerville and Points West. And every mile of the way, Nancy chattered away like a magpie. She kept quoting some of the stuff she had read on the subject. A lot of authorities who decided that some of the reports on haunted towns and houses and people, things like that, had decided there was something really supernatural about them. And you know, after a while, I began to wonder. Yep, I began to wonder. of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the ghost to ghost matter. Lake City, nestled in among the soft, rolling North Jersey hills. But a kind of has-been town. I saw the reason for that in the abandoned mill, the old McAndrews cotton mill on one side of the lake. The same old story, I guess, when a town's main industry closes down, it kind of goes to pot. Nonetheless, it was a charming little place. Population, oh, maybe four or five hundred. When we finally located Oscar Trimley's insurance office, we found a bit of a gathering there. And Mr. Dollar, that is Miss Turner and Mr. Dollar. This is Charlie Reed. Oh, I'm very happy to know you. Foster and oh, yeah. Tony Gray. Oh, yeah. We're oh. sort of a local businessmen's club, Johnny, you know. Okay, now let's get to the point. Oh, uh, sit down, sit down. Well, thank you. Uh, Johnny, uh, I thought over the phone that you were turning us down. Well, I, I changed my mind, and uh, when I thought of Nancy and her knowledge of the supernatural... Good. That's what we need. Well, yeah, you're right. well I am interested in the subject. We're all a little worried about it. Tony isn't kidding. I think we're a pretty level-headed bunch, but, well, this thing has us scared. That's putting it mildly. If it really is his ghost that's plaguing oh, us... Oh, now, you don't seriously believe in... Well, wait and you'll see... Gee, Johnny. Well, suppose you tell me what's going on. Well, no, 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 Johnny. You'll have to see for yourself. And here. Yes, Charlie, and here. And that means waiting until midnight. Midnight? Sure, Mr. Dollar. Well, just why, Bill? You, you'll see. Yes, in the meantime, you can look around. Say, aren't you quite a fisherman, Johnny? Oh, I'd rather fish than eat, but now look. Oh, you... I love to fish, too. Oh, the lake's full of nice bass. Charlie, you can fix him up with a boat, can't you? Oh, sure can. Yes, but if I'm going to invest... Tony, you'll arrange for a place for Miss Turner to stay overnight. Be glad to. Well, now... And Johnny, you'll stay at my home, all right? Fine, but now... No, tell me... no, I want you to see for yourself at midnight. Now, meantime, good fishing. Right. Now, I've got to get back to the shop before Mrs. Bixley starts screaming about her high pipe. See you later. Yeah, and I'll come back to the office and arrange somewhere for Miss Turner to stay. See you later. See you, Tony. Now, if you folks will come over to the print shop with me, we'll pick up the keys to my boat and some tackle, and you can be on your way. Look, can't you at least give me some idea? Nope, nope, not a thing until midnight. Oh, 
And we'll all have dinner together at the hotel. Uh, Mr. Turner. Well, you ready, uh, Mr. Turner? Johnny? Yeah. <laughs> you fellas are the boss, I guess. Fishing, Nancy. I'd love it. I'll even give you some of the fast strike hooks I use. Okay, then let's go. There was something slightly screwy about the whole thing. And I don't mean just the talk of a ghost. But when I go fishing and at company expense, well, who's to complain? So Nancy and I spent the rest of the day on the lake. Matter of fact, she caught the big one. By dinner time, we were starved, and the little hotel served us not only excellent cocktails, but a regular banquet complete with champagne. You enjoying it, Miss Turner? Mmm, I love it. Only why don't you call me Nancy? Sure, why not? Charlie, I'll tell your wife. Now, Tony, you stay out of this. <laughs> Mr. Trimley, about uh, this ghost business. This is champagne, you know, comes from the old Leland Stanford Vineyard. Oh, yes, and it's fine. Uh, but... Finest I know. But it's time we talk about your ghost. Say, you land any big ones out on the lake? Uh, yeah, Bill, Nancy got a four-pounder. But now listen, would you... Another thing about this fine California wine. Hey, didn't wine. I see you navigating the boat, Nancy? Uh, listen, would you please? Well, I got one last year, weighed six and a half, fellas. Fellas, go on over here, the only continent. Hey, fellas, I would have... Please, will you tell me a little bit about... All I want to know is... So, I got nowhere. But then, finally, after a lot more food and wine and chatter, we drove off in Tony's car. Now, I'm stopping here in the middle of town, Johnny, because it's the best place to be when things start popping. Like what? Hey, when are you fellas going to stop this runaround and start making sense? You'll see, you'll see. I'm all excited. Look, Johnny. Yeah, Charlie. You see the old tower clock? Almost midnight. So what about that? Old McAndrews passed away at the stroke of midnight, Johnny. Personally, I think that has something to do with this. You still haven't told me with what? Uh, wait. Listen. There goes the tower clock. Oh, midnight. Count them, Johnny. That was four, five. And Johnny, see how all the lights are flickering along the street? That happens every night? And no reason for it. Look. Bats! Huh? Millions of bats coming out of that clock tower! Yeah. Yeah, I see them. But I don't... What under the sun is that? That's the ghost, wailing. Oh, now, wait a minute. That scream fills the air, comes from everywhere. It's a horrible sound. Johnny. Easy, honey. No, listen. Didn't you hear? That clock struck 13. Yes, Johnny. I guess... You ask me, the devil's in old McAndrew's ghost. That's why it comes out of his house every night. Out of his house? Right, Johnny. And wait till you see what's there. Right. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Ghost to Ghost Matter. Is the front door of this old house always left wide open? You got it, Johnny. Sure you want to go in? Sure. Come along, Nancy. I, uh, I'm coming. Oh, there was more light around. Oh, oh. Well, that's nice. Slam right in our faces. I knew it. Unlocked, though. Let me have that flashlight, Tony. Get it. Yeah. Hmm. No sign of wires or strings on it. Come on. Oh, uh, okay. Come on, fellas. Now, Johnny. Yeah, Bill? As you can see, there's just one big room downstairs here. <gasps> Johnny. Easy, Nancy, easy. Don't you see Look, that? I admit this is all pretty strange. But a ghost. Well, what else? We've been over this house with a fine-tooth comb. Hey, listen. You hear that? Somebody. Somebody's walking on the ceiling. And listen. Oh. oh. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff you hear. Poltergeist. Noisy spirits. You can hear them, but you can't see them. Don't you see, Johnny? It can't be anything normal or natural. Is that the end? No, sir. The, the old ghost has a regular... See? Hear those shutters banging? There's no wind out there. Why? Why didn't you tell me it'd be like this, Johnny? Let's... Look. Yeah. Lights moving around somewhere outside. You can see the reflection in the trees. But they're green. Ghost lights. Oh! Johnny, look! 
rocking chair. It's rocking. In front of the window, where old McAndrews used to sit and look out on the town before he died. Give me the flashlight. Here. Mm. No strings or wires on this either. Well, well. That's the end of it. The same crazy routine every night. It's the ghost of Ian McAndrews. That's all there is to it. Well, from what you fellas have shown me tonight, it kind of looks that way. It is, Johnny. But tomorrow I want to investigate these things in broad daylight. I investigated, all right, the old house, the clock tower, everything I could find. And thanks to the help of the boys, we covered a lot of ground. Result? Nothing. Meantime, I noticed that the town, the sleepy little town of Lake City, was being mobbed. People from all over, streets jammed with cars. And as we sat down at lunch at the hotel... Uh, Miss, uh, waitress, will you please bring me another cup of... Oh, dear, she didn't hear me. Where'd they all come from? Yeah, business has certainly picked up around here. Why, yes, I noticed that. Any idea why, Bill? Uh, not the least. No wonder Tony couldn't be with us for lunch. Charlie's at his print shop getting out an extra. Hey, uh, excuse me, excuse me. Aren't you Johnny Dollar, the investigator? Yeah, that's right. Man, can I use you? Now, just let me get a picture. Well, now, wait. Hold, hold it, hold it, hold it. Okay, Johnny. Thanks, thanks a lot. Hey, that photographer's from one of the New York papers. No kidding. Oh, really? Listen, if our price of international press gave out the word about this ghost story... Oh, now, Johnny... Hmm. Okay, Nancy, you all finished? Uh-huh. Then, Oscar... Bill, we're going to leave the check with you and pull out. Uh, you mean uh, leave town? Yep. Going back to Hartford. Good, Johnny. I've investigated. I've come up with nothing. So there's no point in staying around any longer. Oh, oh Johnny. Johnny. Thanks a lot, fellas. And Oscar, I'll send you my expense account. Come on, Nancy. Give up? Hardly. Sure, Nancy and I hit the highway, but for only a few miles. Then shortly after dark, we drove back. And for a couple of hours, for three or four hours... Well, anyhow, shortly before midnight, Nancy and I walked quietly up on the porch of Oscar oh, Tremblay's insurance office. You mean you didn't leave a message at my office to be here tonight? I certainly didn't. I found a message from Charlie. Are you kidding? Somebody left a message at my print shop to be here. And I got one at my radio shop. Well, I'll be Good done. I... Now, I <laughs> want... Of course, they couldn't know your handwriting. Hey, wait a minute. There's somebody outside. Huh? Johnny. Uh, what's he... Good evening, gentlemen. Why? I thought you'd left town, Johnny. What are you doing back Yeah, that's right. I wanted you to think so. Well, listen. The old tower clock has started to strike midnight. Oh, yeah, that's five, six. Boys, I suddenly realized that in all my investigation this morning, I was being handicapped by what I thought was help. What do you mean, Johnny? Yeah, what's that? I had too much help. Two or three of you were with me every second. Well, we wanted to be sure you wouldn't overlook it. That's right. You wanted to be sure I would overlook a few things. Huh? Hey, now, wait. That's 11, 12. Well, hey, it only struck 12. Yeah, that's right. right. It is. No uh, ghostly wail tonight, is there? I know. No, fellas, no. Because the ghost is no more. You uh, found the ghost, Johnny? I found out that he's one of you. Maybe all of you. Oh, oh, what are you, what are you about? About? Alone, without your careful guidance, I finally located that sub-cellar in the old McAndrews house. You did? And that mess of complicated electrical stuff that was making the weird sound effects, the rocking chair, the banging shutters, and so on. Oh. Very clever. Your handiwork, Bill? Sure. Sure. Uh, but, uh, but Johnny... Oh, uh... fellas, it was a wonderful publicity stunt. Especially after international press was notified. But, but you did that. Not only for your radio and electronics shop, Bill, for your real estate business, Tony, your print shop and newspaper, Charlie, and your insurance business, Oscar. Well, now, John. But for the whole not... town, it's going to put Lake City on the map again. Which is to say, the motive wasn't entirely selfish. Well, no, no, of course it wasn't. Okay, okay, man. And because of that, and that alone, I won't give you away. Provided the ghost of Ian McAndrews. Never walks the streets of Lake City again. Well, you can be sure of that, Johnny. I don't know. I suppose I ought to really hit you over the head with this expense account. But, uh, after all, the cause was a kind of worthy one. So I'll be honest with it for a change. And it, uh, was fun to have Nancy Turner along. 
Expense account total, including mileage on the rental car, less deposit, thirty-one fifty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Mutual note for you. Even the most active of youngsters needs a brief let-up now and then from summertime strenuous outdoor play. Every weekday afternoon at 5 o'clock, Mutual presents a variety of programs to delight all children. There are exciting adventures in a fantastic land of imaginary characters where anything is possible and all things are wonderful. Kids and grown-ups, too, will love these fancy-free tales of -of out-of-this-world entertainment. The Best of the West comes your way as well every Monday through Friday afternoon when you can listen to the cowboy songs and tunes that are everyone's favorite. The music that is part of the history of frontier days and that still is part of the background of Western life today brings the color and drama of the open range into your own living room. Everyone young and old alike can take pleasure in Mutual's Children's Hour that offers programs for entrancing listening. Open the door to a limitless world of entertainment for all children. Tune to Mutual every weekday afternoon at 5 o'clock and hear them all over most of these stations. When a bachelor friend of the family tries to tell you how to bring up your children, it isn't very helpful. You want suggestions to come from someone who is more of an authority on the subject. And so it is with gasoline. The paid-for recommendations found in the advertised claims of other fuels are as tinkling brass and sounding cymbal when contrasted with the thoughtful, founded on actual test endorsement given Rio Grande cracked gasoline by the officials of 30 leading cities and counties of California. These recognized authorities choose Rio Grande cracked exclusively to power their police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment. This highest, more convincing recommendation has caused a vast army of thinking motorists to swear loyal allegiance to the gasoline which ranks number one with those who know best because they drive the most. They declare that Rio Grande Cracked meets every one of their rigid requirements, delivers quicker one-punch starting, steady trip hammer acceleration, a longer reach of economical mileage, extra stamina, and greater reserve power. They know what they're talking about. And intelligent motorists appreciate that kind of a recommendation. If you haven't yet joined the parade of motorists who have made a habit of traveling farther for less money, pull in at your Rio Grande dealers tomorrow morning. Fill up with Rio Grande cracked gasoline and begin letting this police car performance fuel make life easier for your motor and your purse. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Parker, Johnny. Surety Mutual. Oh, hi, Joe. What's on your mind? A gorgeous doll named Dolly McLean. Remember her? Sure. The champagne dream girl. Yeah. Dancing darling of the roaring 20s. Uh, finally married Barnaby Cronin, didn't she? Right. And for a wedding present, he bought her the Circle of Fire. Oh, yeah. One of the five most beautiful necklaces in the world. Diamonds and emeralds. Worth a half a million. It's been lying in a bank vault for the last ten years since Barnaby died. We carry the insurance. So? She's coming out of seclusion, Johnny, giving a party. Just like the old days, she says. We go on for a week. The last fling. And she's going to wear the circle of fire. Uh-oh. Get the picture? Gallons of champagne, everything mixed up. Crazy. And that old lady with a half million bucks around her neck. Target. You've got a problem, Joe. Johnny, we've got a problem. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. 
The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Cronin matter. Item one, $14.80. Transportation to New York and to the apartment of America's one-time dream girl. One time, a long time ago. How do you do? I'm Johnny Dollar. I believe Mrs. Cronin is expecting me. I'm Mrs. Cronin, and yes, I am expecting you. Won't you come in? Oh, thanks. I did have butlers and maids and such for years, scads of them. But since Barnaby passed away, I've just hibernated, you might say. Oh, in here, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Ten years now in this same little apartment. As you can see, I've just been living like a little mouse. That looks very comfortable. Oh, I suppose it's comfortable enough, but... Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'd forgotten you were still here. Mm Mm-hmm. But not for long, Mrs. Cronin. Oh, no. Please stay. We'll have some tea or sherry or something as, as soon as... Oh, you two, do you know each other? No, I'm afraid we don't. Oh, but of course not. How could you? Uh, Sylvia, this is Mr. Dollar. Miss Blake. How do you do, Miss Blake? Hello. Mr. Dollar's here to talk to me about, uh, well, something or other. I'm not quite sure what, as a matter of fact. It won't take but a few minutes. If uh, Miss Blake would excuse us. Sure. Go ahead. Have at it. Well, if you'll come this way, Mr. Dollar. Don't you leave now, Sylvia. Not a chance. I just spotted your bottle of tea. I'll have one or two with soda, if you don't mind. With soda? Oh, I see what you mean. You young people. In here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dollar. You by any chance, Johnny Dollar? Yeah, that's right. Uh, why, Miss Blake? Just wondering. Well, he is looking at you. And, brother, I wouldn't be in your shoes for a million dollars. No? How about half a million? That, I'll admit, might interest me. Well, shall we... After you, Mrs. Cronin. Thank you. Wonderful girl, a born comedian. Yeah, she's a scream. What is she, an actress? Oh, no, no, she writes things for magazines and things like that. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. She came to interview me one time. That's how I met her. I see. She wrote a piece about my necklace, The Circle of Fire. Sylvia Blake. Oh, sure. Articles about gems, famous stones, jewel robberies. That's her. Oh, she's fascinated by the subject. She's coming to my party. Oh. Oh, Why don't you come to my party, Mr. Dowler? Fine. I'd love to. In fact, that's why I'm here. Oh? Uh, Joe Parker over at Surety Mutual is kind of worried about this party, Mrs. Cronin. He's afraid you might invite people like me. What? I mean, people you don't know. You're a detective. Um, in a way. I told Joseph how I felt about that. He's not going to send any detectives around snooping into things, spying on my guests, wearing the hats in the house. Huh? Not that you're like that, of course, but it's the principle of the thing. Well, wouldn't you have a better time at your party if you knew you were safe? Mr. Dollar, it was at a party that Barnaby gave me the circle of fire. Our wedding reception. There were over 2,000 guests. A thousand of them invited. And we danced. Oh, we danced all night. And the necklace was beautiful. And I was beautiful. Back then. True, but... And then afterward, at four o'clock in the morning, we drove through the park in a hansom. Just the two of us. And the driver, of course. And I wore the circle... And I was safe, Mr. Dollar. I was perfectly safe. Maybe you were just lucky that night. Barnaby was so wonderful. And he could make living so wonderful. Well, I don't doubt it. He was probably a man who could manage things pretty skillfully. He was running two railroads in a bank all at the same time. Then I imagine he had no trouble arranging for your safety without even letting you know about it. You mean guards all around? It's possible. Yes, it is. He was like that. He never wanted anything to worry me. All right, Mr. Dollar. You win. Good. But it's only because of one reason. I like you, and I want you at my party. Thank you, Mrs. Cronin. Oh, you're going to love every minute of it. It's up in the Adirondacks, our old summer place. Uh, Joseph told you, I suppose. Yes, he did. Mrs. Cronin. And the people I've invited, hundreds, literally, people I knew in the old days. Of course, a lot of them won't come, but, you know, it was strange. So many of the letters came back undelivered. Mrs. Cronin. Oh, Sylvia, I didn't hear you come in. I'm the sneaky type. 
You've got a visitor. Says he's an old friend. Really? Well, I suppose I'd better see you. Uh, you'll excuse me, Mr. Dollar. Sure, go ahead. You and Sylvia talk to each other. I uh, brung the bottle in case you're interested. Show it on the soda. Right. She's on a cloud by herself. Of course, some of the invites to the party were undelivered. Those beautiful people had a habit of dying young. Say when. When? Who's the visitor? I'll guess with you. Looks like an overgrown leprechaun. Said his name was Shorty Weber. Shorty Weber? You know him? I know of him. An old-time song and dance man, among other things. He probably worked in a show with him back in those dear, dead days. Anyway, he's got an invite clutched in his sweaty little palm. Another free loader, I suppose. Aren't we all? I am, yes. Not you, though. You're working your way. Isn't that what you're doing, one way or another? Meaning? A magazine article, just in case. Written right on the spot. Attempted theft of the circle of fire. Clever jewel. Why do you say attempted? I'm working my way, remember? Sure, I remember. But it won't be attempted, Johnny. Somebody's going to get that necklace before the weekend is over. I'll bet on it. Would you care to name any names? Pick a name off the guest list. Any name. Suppose I pick Sylvia Blake. You're the detective. You've dug up and written up every big-time jewel theft over the last 50 years. You're bugged on the subject, obsessed with beautiful gems. Fits my personality. I'm rather beautiful, too, in a brittle and glittering sort of way. Don't you think so, Johnny? I think you work pretty hard at that tough act. Maybe. And I think you'd give your right arm to own that necklace. Going after that would really be going for the big one. Going for broke. And somebody will do it, Johnny. Wait and see. She left a few minutes later with the bottle under her arm and a chip on her shoulder. With the girl gone and the scotch gone, there seemed to be no point in me hanging around any longer. So I went looking for Mrs. Cronin to say goodbye. I didn't find her, but I did find her caller, Shorty Weber. He didn't hear me come into the room. He was too busy. He was hunched over Mrs. Cronin's writing desk going through her mail. You won't find it there, Shorty. Who's that Hold woman? it, Shorty. Don't try to reach for it. I, I, I wasn't going to. Honest, I wasn't. Turn around. Put your hands up against the wall. You, you got me all wrong. I wasn't okay, going to do it. Okay, relax. I was uh, just 38, coming... stub barrel, clip holster. Nice gun. It uh, belongs to a friend of mine. Bad business, Shorty. An ex-con packing a gun. Oh, I guess you're Johnny Dollar. She said you was here. And I, I, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar, but you're wrong. Why, Dolly, uh, Mrs. Cronin... She's an old friend of mine. I tried to get her to marry me once over 30 years ago. A lot can I... happen in 30 years. Does she know you've served time in prison? No. She thinks I was on tour, Europe and Australia. She never reads a paper or hears anything. Don't tell her, Mr. Dollar. Please don't. You know, it's quite a coincidence, Shorty. It was Jules that time. A big affair in New Orleans. And you were hired as an entertainer. A diamond bracelet, wasn't it? And you were caught cold. It's the only time in my life I've ever done anything like that. And I went again. Not especially not to her. Why, I, I, I'm planning to look out for it at this party. That's why I bought the gun. And is that why you were going through a mail there? Yeah. I wanted to see who was coming. I learned things while I was doing time. I know how the word gets around in a big deal like this. There's a lot of wrong guys in this world. No argument, Shorty. Yeah, well, you matter. You, you, you know how she is. She's a babe in the woods on something like this. Does my ears be burning, or is it some other babe you mean? Not for me, Dolly. You're the only babe I ever could see. Oh, Shorty, you never give up. Oh, uh, do you two know each other? Uh, not exactly, but we found we had a mutual friend. A certain state prison warden. Oh, how nice. Shorty's always doing benefits at those places. Uh, Dolly. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was it. He did a benefit there. Oh, well, I'll bet you weren't over big. Well, you know. You're too modest, Shorty. Why they loved him, Mrs. Cronin. Hated to let him leave. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, speaking of leaving, uh, I got a shove now. Don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> it was crazy and corny and sad. The whole idea. I guess the sadness of it hit me when I was saying goodbye to Mrs. Cronin at the door. The gaiety slipped for a moment, and suddenly she was old and tired. And at the same time, she was a scared little girl. And then she said something strange, and the shivers ran up my back. 
Do you believe in premonitions, Johnny? Well, I have a hunch now and then. Well, whatever it is, it's the reason I'm doing this. Having this party. One last fling, you might say. Before it's too late. Oh, come now. You're still a young woman, Mrs. Cronin. No. I'm old, Johnny. I've been old for years. Since Barnaby died. We loved each other so... But... That's not what I mean. I've had this premonition lately. What sort of a premonition? That something awful... Something terrible is going to happen to me. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a man who's afraid of his shadow... A girl who's afraid of nothing. And a stranger who strikes in the dark. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. We hope that you've enjoyed this recording, and for more happy listening, please visit otrcat.com. But first, there's a world of wonderful entertainment awaiting you every weekday in the daytime with CBS Radio's roster of wonderful dramatic serials. This Monday, listen in. And now, for the second act of Gunsmoke. Not so many years ago, tomato soup and cream of tomato were unusual dishes, enjoyed very much, but not very often. Today, of all the soups in the world, tomato soup is the one most often served. Not because women have taken to making tomato soup frequently. No, on the contrary, few housewives ever attempt it anymore. There's just one reason for tomato soup's popularity, and it is this. The magic, matchless flavor of Campbell's tomato soup. There's a lively verve, a dashing zest about this flavor that people take to at once and come back to and enjoy again and again. The first racy taste of it has a way of arousing a desire to eat, and yet there's a pleasant feeling of satisfaction when the last spoonful is gone. So this soup is a happy choice for the main dish at lunchtime or at supper, and it also is a fine way to start the day's main meal. Serve it sometimes, too, as cream of tomato, made with milk instead of water. You can always be sure that it will be received with pleasure. Because this, of all soups, is the one people like to have most often. Campbell's Tomato Soup. And now, Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite co-stars Miss Ethel Barrymore and Mr. Gene Kelly in To Find Help. A suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. 
Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations. Friends, when you buy an Autolite Stay Full battery, you're not getting just another ordinary battery. No, sir, you're getting a battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Yes, Autolite Stay Full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. Why, a camel could drink its weight in water and a cactus could die of thirst before those tough, temperate, teetotaling Autolite Stay Full batteries would ask for an extra drop of H2O. So, friends, switch to an Autolite Stay Full battery tomorrow. Remember, you're right with Autolite. Always right with Autolite. And now Autolite presents Gene Kelly and Ethel Barrymore in a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. My rumor, Mr. Armstrong, tried to warn me that morning he left on his business trip. I remember we were just finishing breakfast and he was rather in a hurry. I don't care what you say, Mrs. Gillis. I just plain don't like it. You're alone here in the house all day. There are no close neighbors, and after all, you know nothing about the man. Good gracious, Mr. Armstrong, you think I was a pretty young thing of 20 to hear you tell it. And another thing, it seems very strange to me that a young man should be job hunting from door to door this day and age. Why, there are plenty of jobs to be had. That's just why it's so difficult to find help these days. You're a worrywart, Mr. Armstrong. Now that I've found someone to do my heavy work, I'm not going to let your silly notions change my mind. Well, all the same, though, I'm not leaving the house this morning till I get a look at the guy. I remember I kept worrying about poor Mr. Armstrong missing his train, because it was getting to be nine o'clock. He dried the breakfast dishes for me. As he talked, he kept looking out of the window toward the long driveway. Hey, here he comes. What? <laughs> I guess I needn't have worried. <laughs> Mr. Armstrong was smiling, for he'd seen my young man who was coming up the driveway, and I smiled, too. Even I had forgotten what a meek, harmless-looking lad he was, and why he would hardly be called a man at all, I thought. <laughs> so that's the critter who's been causing me all this mental language. And there, you see, you and your silly ideas. <laughs> why, the little guy's not strong enough to keep a regular job, I suppose. <laughs> why, I believe Sarah's getting some of your foolish notions, Mr. Armstrong. <laughs> There, now, Sarah. Sarah, I'm sorry that we made you nervous about it. Why, if you could see the guy... Shh. He'll hear you. Good morning, lad. I've been expecting you. This is my rumor, Mr. Armstrong. I don't believe you told me your name. I'm Howard Wilton, ma'am. Hello, Howard. How are you? I'm glad you've come. I know you'll be a great help to Mrs. Gillis here, and uh, you'll be company, too. Well, I'm off, Mrs. Gillis. Take care of yourself. I, uh... Don't think you'll have much trouble. I don't think your dog likes me, Mrs. Gillis. Of course she does. She's just getting a little old and peevish. Oh. Come along now, Howard. I'll show you where to hang your coat. Oh, yes. I always like to hang my coat up. He followed me in the closet storeroom at the back of the house. And I handed him a clothes hanger and a rough, heavy apron, which I kept for cleaning help. Is this apron clean, Mrs. Gillis? Why, of course it's clean. No one's worn it since it was laundered last. There are spots on it. See? Spots? Yeah. Let me look. Why, that's paint. No dirt and dried paint, son. If you don't mind, I'd rather not wear it. What will you wear, then? You didn't bring other clothes. I'm a neat worker, Mrs. Gillis. You needn't worry about my clothes. I turned, and the light hitting his face from the small window made him look so different. I was startled for a moment, and then I thought, you're a silly old woman, Mrs. Gillis. And then I smiled. Are you laughing at me, Mrs. Gillis? Why, no, son. I was laughing at myself. Come along. Let's get started now. He'd only been at the den floor a short time when I heard him walk back to the closet storeroom. Can I help you, son? Going after my coat, Mrs. Gillis. I don't like it being out there in the storeroom. It's a breeding place for moths, you know. Now, son, it takes longer than that for moths to do any damage. Mrs. Gillis, perhaps you won't think it's quite so amusing when I tell you that it's my best and only coat. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, lad. Where would you like to put it? In the kitchen, perhaps? No, the cooking fumes wouldn't be good for it. I'll take it right in the den with me. That is, if you don't mind. 
Go right ahead, Howard. I appeared off my. Suddenly, I was thankful that there was a phone. He was such a peculiar boy. I wasn't really alarmed. Not then, I wasn't. Still, it was good to know the phone was there and that old Sarah was still in the kitchen asleep. I went on about my own work that morning. But several times I went into the den to have a look at him. He wasn't doing much, I could see that. He seemed to keep polishing one small square in the corner of the room. Is there anything you need, Howard? Howard! I won't be spied upon, Mrs. Gillis. I won't put up with that. See here, lad, I think we must have gotten off on the wrong foot. I'm not spying on you. Now, why do you keep popping in like that? Would you like me to go faster? Would you like me to spill out my life's blood for you here on the floor? Is that what you're after? Howard, are you well? Are you well enough to work? Of course I'm well. Only you quit bothering and pestering and questioning me. Is it too much to ask? Howard, son, I'm interested in young men. I had two boys of my own. They were in the service. See, that's Bill on the desk there. He was a Marine. And on the table there, that's Dennis. He was in the infantry. So, that's why you hate me. I see it all now. Hate you? Why, whatever gave Yes, you... you hate me. I could tell at the moment I walked into your house this morning. But, Howard... You hate me because I'm young and I wasn't in the service like your boy. Why, it never occurred to me. You must know I was grateful when you came looking for grateful. work. Grateful? You resented me. The only reason you have me here is to work my life's blood away, to punish me for not being in the service, just because your sons were in the service and I wasn't. Son, you're ill. Let's put the work away now. I'll make you a cup of tea. Oh, you don't want me to do the job. Is that it? You're like the army. There was a job to be done, and they wouldn't let me in. Now you'd like me to stop in the middle of this. I only want you to do whatever will make you feel better. Well, leave me alone, then. Very well. Mrs. Gillis... Yes? I'll tell you why I wasn't in the army. If you insist. I don't insist at all, Howard. If you must know, I'll tell you. They said there was something wrong with my mind. Suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Gene Kelly, co-starring with Miss Ethel Barrymore in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Pap, I had a very embarrassing experience at New Year's Day dinner. Well, what in the world happened, huh? Well, the whole family was there, you see. Brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins, outlaws. What? I mean in-laws. <laughs> and during a lull in the conversation, I thought I'd tell them all about that wonderful, abstemious, autolite, stay-full battery. Oh, my. So naturally, I told them about that extra-large liquid reserve of autolite, stay-full batteries. Even the Great Lakes, said I, are no great shakes compared to the reservoir in those Autolite Stay Full batteries. Why, those batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. I'm beginning to understand. And then, of course, I told them that Autolite Stay Full batteries give longer life than batteries without the Stay Full features. And then I explained... Well, wait a minute, Hunter. Did you say all this at your big family dinner? Yes, and here's the funny thing, Hap. Just as I was telling them how every smart car owner was switching to Autolite Stay Full batteries... Two of my biggest cousins got up, came around to my chair, and carried me, chair and all, into the pantry. By Cornelius, the pantry was where I finished my New Year's dinner. <laughs> Can you imagine my own relatives doing a thing like that to well, me? Well, that certainly was a dirty trick, Arnold, but quiet. Here's suspense again. And now, Autolite brings back to a Hollywood soundstage Miss Ethel Barrymore and Mr. Gene Kelly in to find help. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I just thought maybe you'd like to know, Mrs. Gillis. They said there was something wrong with my mind. The first thing that I thought of when I reached the hallway was the phone. But it was in the den with Howard. I ran quickly to the back door, but it was locked, and the key wasn't in its usual place. The front door 
were locked too. Then I heard a crash. It came from the den. I rushed in to find Howard peacefully polishing away at the same spot. He hadn't moved an inch. He didn't look up at me. Then I saw the phone which had fallen to the floor beside him. But it hadn't just fallen. The wires had been torn out of the wall. The phone, Mrs. Gillis, it fell. But the wires... I suppose you think I ruined your phone. The wires... That happened when it fell to the floor. It could It happened have... when it fell to the floor. But, uh... I don't suppose you'll be able to use it anymore. Not for a while, anyway. No, I don't suppose I will. Sarah, here, Sarah, Sarah. Mrs. Gillis. Yes. Are you looking for your dog? Yes, yes, I haven't seen her all morning. She was in the kitchen. Well, she's not there any longer. I know. Where is she, Howard? Where is she? Yes, where is she? She's gone. Gone. If you've harmed her... She didn't like me, you know. See here. I've put up with enough. You tell me where my dog is. Or... Do what, Miss Gillis? I'll... You do I'll... what, Mrs. Gillis? What will you do? Sarah! She's yes, gone, Sarah. Mrs. Gillis. I told you that. You've harmed my dog. Have I? You killed her. Poor old Sarah, who never heard a thing. She would have hurt me. You're bad, Howard. You're wicked. You're a coward. Not a coward, Mrs. Gillis. Cowards are afraid to kill. Only a coward would kill a poor old dog. If I were a coward, I'd, I'd be afraid of you. And I'm not afraid of you. You let me out of here. I have strong hands, Mrs. Gillis. My fingers are like steel. I've never harmed you. No, and Sarah didn't either, but she would have if I hadn't harmed her first. Let me out of here. You're getting very noisy, Mrs. Gillis. Perhaps if I locked you in here, you'd calm down a Howard, bit. Howard, Howard! <laughs> And I heard the key turn in the lock. For a moment, I had the feeling of unreality. Was this really happening? But I found out soon enough that it wasn't a dream. For the dim light from the little square window picked up a limp, lifeless object in the corner among the dusty mops. I knew without looking further what it was. Poor Sarah. Sarah, who'd never harmed a soul. <laughs> I don't know how long he kept me there. I could hear him moving about the house. But he finally came. He spoke to me through the door. Have you calmed down, Mrs. Gillis? Yes, Howard. Let me out. Why? Because it's warm in here. Because I want to get out. You were looking for your dog, weren't you? Never mind about that, Howard. Let me out. Mrs. Gillis? If I kept you in there, you wouldn't be able to spy on me ever again. I won't spy on you, Howard. Let me out. Do you know what I've been doing, Mrs. Gillis? No. I've been doing your den floors, just like you asked me to. That's fine, Howard. It was fine, being able to work peacefully. Knowing that you were someplace where you couldn't bother me. I won't bother you, Howard. It was very peaceful. Nobody to bother me. Let me out, Howard. Will you promise to do as I tell you? I promise. Anything? Anything. Very well, then. Now, no tricks. No. Feel my hands, Mrs. Gillis. Are they nice hands? Yes, they're nice hands. You haven't felt them. Did your sons have as nice hands as these? No. No, they didn't. But they didn't have any trouble getting jobs, did they? I'm just as good as they were, you know. Of course you are, Howard. Wouldn't you like some food, lad? You haven't eaten it all day, you know. Some food would be good. Yeah, let me, let me fix you some. Mrs. Gillis? A woman I worked for once said my hands were weak. She did. She soon found out, however... Here now, lad, I have some nice cold roast in the icebox. I taught her a lesson. It'll only take a minute to fix some salad. Were your son's hands strong, Mrs. Gillis? Uh, not as strong as yours, Howard. I'll set the table right away. Mrs. Gillis, feel my hands again. They're like steel, you know. 
I finally managed to get some lunch on the table. Howard sat beside me. He didn't say much. He ate very little. I tried to appear casual, to engage him in conversation, anything. Do you work often, Howard? Not often. Do you have trouble finding jobs? People are anxious to find help these days. Weren't you? Yes, to find help. Mrs. Gillis? They're looking for me. Who, Howard? I don't know exactly. People I worked for last, I guess. Was that here in this town? No. It was another town. Everyone was looking for me, so I went away. It's horrible to be spied upon, Mrs. Gillis. Do you know what it is to be spied upon? No. No, I don't. Would you like to know? No, I... I wouldn't, Howard. I think I'll spy on you the rest of the day. Then you'll know how it feels. No, no, please, Howard. Whatever it is you want, take it and go away. There's nothing I want, nothing. I I only want to stay here with you. I can't stand it, Howard. I can't. I'm an old woman. Please go away. Leave me alone. I'm not going away, Mrs. Gillis. (laughs) There's still a job to be done. I'll go away after I've done everything that's to be done. Howard, I have some money here in the kitchen cabinet drawer. It's a great deal. I'll give it to you. I don't want your money, Mrs. Gillis. Then go away. That would be foolish. Then you'd tell on me. No, I wouldn't really, Howard. Go away and I'll never tell a soul that you've been here. I don't believe you. And I don't trust you. There's only one way of being certain that you won't tell. My heart jumped when I looked out the window. I saw it was the milkman. Tell him to go away. I can't. I've ordered some extra things. Then go into the storeroom until he goes. I can't, Howard. He knows I'm here. He'll expect me to pay him. You promised to do as I told you. And he pulled open the cabinet drawer. I saw him take a knife out. Now, will you tell him to go away? Uh, if I tell him to go, he'll think something's wrong. Then you'll get caught for sure. All right, Mrs. Gillis. Take whatever you've ordered, but if you pull any tricks, you'll be sorry. Just a moment. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Gillis. Good afternoon. It's a lovely day, isn't it? Yes, it is. Mrs. Gillis, I think I have good news for you. You have? Yeah. Beginning the first, the company's taking on some more help. And in the future, your deliveries will be made in the early morning. That's nice. I don't believe you ever did like these late deliveries, did you? I never really minded. <laughs> if all of our customers were like you, Mrs. Gillis, it wouldn't be such a bad world. Here you are. One quart of milk and a pint of half and half. Goodbye, Mrs. Gillis. Uh, the, the extra things. You forgot them. The extra things? Yes, the extra things. Now, don't tell me you, you've forgotten them, the, the eggs and the, the, the butter. Uh, uh, okay, I'll get them right away. Mrs. Gillis, I'm going to give you one more chance. When he comes back, you're to get rid of him, do you hear? And if you give me away, I'm going to kill you. I'll kill you before he can get inside this house, and I don't care what they do to me. I won't give you away, Howard. I'll only pay him. I'll have to do that. Shut up. And remember. Here you are, Mrs. Gillis. Thank you. Anything else? No. That's all. Mrs. Gillis, uh, I was going to say... I'm sorry, I can't stop. I can't talk today. I'm very busy. You're very clever, aren't you, Mrs. Gillis? What do you mean? You thought you were going to put something over on me, didn't you? I sent him away, didn't I? The extra things you ordered. There weren't any. Yes, there were. You saw him. You heard him. You didn't know what you were talking about. The milkman. I returned. He stood outside the window. Howard looked at me. I saw his knuckles grow white as he clutched the knife. This is your last chance. Get rid of him. I will, Howard. I will. I'm sorry to bother you again, Mrs. Gillis, but you forgot to pay me. Oh. That is, unless you want no, to... No, yes, yes, I'll pay you. Here you are. Uh, sorry I had to bother you, Mrs. Gillis. But you see, this is the day I have to come... Yes, yes, I'm busy. Can't you see that I'm very busy? Tell me when he's gone, Mrs. Gillis. I stood by the window and watched. He got into his truck, and then he drove off. So that was your scheme, was it? So you wanted to give me away. He's gone now, Howard. You thought he'd save you, didn't you? No, no, I sent him away like you asked me. Do you know what would have happened to me? Do you? 
They would have taken me away. Howard, leave me alone. I'm going to punish you. No, Howard, I've been punished enough. No, you haven't. Yes. He was standing very close now. I knew he still held the knife. Suddenly everything was black. I slipped to the floor. <laughs> When I came to, I was on the kitchen floor. My head throbbed. There I remembered everything. But where was he? And I heard a sound, a soft, swishing sound. It seemed like hours before I could bring myself to move. And suddenly, the hall clock began to strike. Why, it was five o'clock. I'd been unconscious for longer than I'd thought. The room had already turned dark in the late afternoon light, but I could see him now. He stood in the middle of the room. He was pushing my heavy floor polisher back and forth, back and forth. I tried to close the door quietly, but he looked up. He saw me. What time is it, Mrs. Gillis? About five. Well, I guess I'll call it a day now. I've done a nice job, haven't I? Yes, Howard. Very nice. I think I'll be going now. Doesn't it shine nicely, Mrs. Gillis? Yes. Yes, it does. Is it worth five dollars to you? Yes, Howard. I have nice hands, haven't I, Mrs. Gillis? Yes, Howard, you have. Here, take the money. Thank you. It's a pity they have to be used to polish floors. You've done such a good job, Howard. I'm going to give you a few extra dollars. Thank you. You'll be needing me tomorrow, Mrs. Gillis? No, thank you, Howard. The door's locked, Mrs. Gillis. Yes, Howard. Do you have the key? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I do. I just remember. I, I just remembered a lot of things. Mrs. Gillis, there's someone at the door. Yes, Howard. Will you open it? Well, should I? Yes, Howard. You have the key. I have? Oh, is this it, Mrs. Gillis? Yes, Howard. Open the door. Open the door, Howard. Open it. All right, Mrs. Gillis. I'm Mr. Stevens from the phone company. Your phone's been reported out of order. Mrs. Gillis, is your phone out of order? No, no, there must be a mistake. Huh, that's strange. We've had several reports. Uh, maybe I better run back and check my books. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Stevens. Could you do me a favor? <laughs> well, why, certainly. This boy... Mrs. Gillis. This boy, he's worked here all day. He's done a good job, but I don't think he's well. I'm all right, Mrs. Gillis. But you're tired. Aren't you tired, Howard? Doesn't your head ache? Uh, yes. Yes, I, I am tired. and My head does ache. Well, maybe Mr. Stevens will be kind enough to drive you to the car line. Well, I'd be glad to, Mrs. Gillis, but I can't wait long. Right away, and I'll go along too. I have some marketing to do. And Mr. Stevens, as long as you're here, would you mind checking the phone just to make sure? Well, well, of course. I'll show you where it is. Can I show him, Mrs. Gillis? No, Howard, you wait here. We'll be right back. I moved quickly toward the den. Mr. Stevens followed me. Once inside, I closed the door behind me. He spotted the torn wires at once. Say, this phone. Shh. It's that boy. That man. He's dangerous. Drive us to the police station as fast as you can. Well, I... Before he could reply, I opened the den door and went out into an empty room. Say. Howard! He's gone. Yeah, it sure looks that way. No, no, you've got to find him. But, Mrs. Gillis, if you were afraid of You don't of understand. It... He's angry with me. He wants to kill me. And now he's he's hiding here somewhere. When you go, he'll come out and, and kill me. Oh, say that, ma'am. Take it easy. You're getting yourself all worked up. You don't believe me. Well, look, Mrs. Gillis, maybe i better run down to the corner and phone for no, somebody. No, no, huh? you can't leave me. I, I'll go with you. Well, sure, if it'll make you feel any better. My car's right outside in the driveway. Yes. Come on. Yes, and I'll call the police. They'll come and get him. Sure, whatever you say. 
He looked like a nice enough young fellow, though. Are you sure that he... Were you looking for me, Mrs. Gillis? Why, yes, Howard. I was. Are you ready to go? Yes, I, I'm ready. I just thought I'd wait in the car. Sure, sure. All right, Mrs. Gillis. You get in the back here. Thank you. It's very kind of you to do this for me. I, I'm very tired. Just relax, Howard. We'll take care of you. Already? Already, Mr. Stevens. Mr. Stevens. Huh? Don't you think I have nice hands? Why? I, yes, I, I, I guess so. Yes. The strong hands, too. Very strong. <laughs> Thank you, Gene Kelly and Ethel Barrymore, for a splendid performance. Our stars will return in just a moment. Say, uh, Hap, yeah. I've got a wonderful New Year's resolution here. Well, don't tell me you resolved to give up talking, Otto. Give up talking? Me, Auto Light, Patter Packed Wilcox? <laughs> I will a pistol packing cowboy give up his gun? Will a power packed Auto Light stay full battery give up the ghost when you need it most? Not on your life, by Cornelius. No, sir, Hap, the New Year's resolution I've got is for every car owner who doesn't already have an Autolite stay-full battery. And the resolution reads, I resolve at the earliest opportunity, that is tomorrow morning, to drive down to my nearest Autolite dealer and get a brand new Autolite stay-full battery. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. For remember, friends, you're right with Autolite. And remember, too... Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition engineered resistor spark plugs. Autolite means ignition systems. The lifeline of your car. And now, here again is Mr. Gene Kelly. It's always a pleasure to appear on Suspense, but it was especially wonderful playing opposite a truly great lady of the stage and screen. Miss Ethel Barrymore. Why, thank you, Gene. It was a great pleasure for me, too. Even though in the story I had a harrowing time of it. Well, that's the specialty of suspense, Miss Barrymore. That's why I try never to miss a program. For instance, next week, radio's outstanding theater of thrills presents Danny Kay in a new kind of role. For him. He plays a murderer in a story titled The Two Perfect Alibi. And you can be sure it's another gripping study in... Suspense. Gene Kelly can currently be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer All-Star Technical or Musical Words and Music based on the lives and music of Rogers and Hart. Ethel Barrymore may currently be seen in the David O. Selznick production Portrait of Jenny. Tonight's suspense play was by Mel Dinelli with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leder. Next Thursday, same time, hear Danny Kaye in The Too Perfect Alibi. with Autolite. So switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Dr. Weir's mystery will be continued shortly. Say, by the way, Doctor, is mystery your sole pleasure, young man? What could be more pleasant than mystery? Well, music, for instance. That music, that... why, of course. Have you ever heard my clanking of chains? Uh, Doctor, I'm afraid you've got me wrong. I mean the kind of music men hum or whistle when they feel on top of the world. And gentlemen, one of the many things that give you that tip-top feeling is the pleasure of being well-dressed. Perfect taste is a criterion. And in hats, there's nothing smarter than an atom. From stem to stern, your atom hat gives off that look of quality. You see quality in the carefully molded shape and in the richness of the genuine all-fur felt and in the subtle color shade. Next time you pass an Adam hat store or authorized dealer, stop in and try on an Adam. Once you see and wear an Adam hat, 
you'll agree that today, as before, Adam is one of America's outstanding half values. Now, the uh, good Dr. Weird. Vietnam Network presents anything you want to know about drugs but don't know who to ask. Your questions on drugs and drug abuse. This question comes to us from a group of individuals in Da Nang. They ask, what is an LSD trip like? An LSD trip varies according to the dosage, the personality of the user, and the conditions under which the drug is taken. Basically, it causes changes in sensation. Vision is the most markedly altered. Changes in depth perception and the meaning of the object seen are also frequently described. Illusions and hallucinations can also occur. Thinking may become pictorial, and daydreaming states are also common. Delusions are also sometimes experienced. The sense of time and of yourself are strangely altered. Strong emotional feelings may range from bliss to horror, sometimes within a single experience. Sensations may cross over. That is, music may be seen or color heard. The individual is suggestible and, especially under high doses, loses his ability to discriminate and to evaluate his experience. This response provided by the McPhee Task Force on Drug Abuse. If you have a question, anything you want to know about drugs but don't know who to ask, ask us and we'll try to find the answer. AFVN, APO in country, 96309.